So like I said, we've got tonight's lecture, which is on pediatrics, and then we're going to go into geriatrics on next Tuesday. We're not going to have class Thursday night because that's Christmas Eve, and I'm not a robot, and I don't expect you all to be. Um, <clears throat> this is a very, 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 very long chapter tonight, so it's going to take uh, probably a lot longer than some of you may even want to be in the class for. So if you decide to call it a night, I understand. If the... Uh, the brakes aren't fast enough or whatever you need them take them this is recorded this is one of those lectures that you may decide to take a break while i'm still going is perfectly fine if you hadn't been doing that the whole time already anyway um but anyway yeah i might not even i might not even give 10 minute breaks i might just give myself time to get something to drink that kind of thing and then just get back to lecturing um this one's kind of a gauntlet so bear with me Anyway, let's get started. So we are going to be talking about pediatrics tonight. And by the way, there's like 239 slides to this. So this is a long, long, long chapter. We're going to be recapping pretty much everything that we have done for the entire class, but we're going to be looking at it from a pediatric standpoint. So whereas we've talked about trauma and medical emergencies and things of that sort, with the exception of certain um, things that only happen in children, like we talked about earlier in the class, We've done everything to this point from a adult point of view. <clears throat> so now we're going to look at kids. Um, there are little differences. I will try to stick to the highlights for things, but um, just know that they're not. Don't let them scare you. Children differ. Um, this is, you know, you're, I kind of disagree with your slide to this point. They says they differ anatomically. They don't. The anatomy of a child is the same as the anatomy of an adult. There's just some minor differences. They're smaller. Uh, physically, yes, there's differences. In, and emotionally, there's some major differences. Um, the way that they see you as a provider, they're not going to see you as somebody they can trust to help them, for example. A lot of times, it's going to be stranger danger, and you're going to have to deal with that while you're trying to give them medical care. The illnesses and the injuries that children sustain and their responses to them will vary based on the age or development level. So anybody that's ever gone and tried to talk to kids, be it like for fire prevention week, for example, any firefighters in here that have done that, if you're talking to fifth and sixth graders, they're fantastic, right? The minute you mention stop, drop, and roll, they're going to jump up and do it, show you know they don't know how to do it. If you're teaching day, daycare kids, they're usually just staring at you, picking their nose, and then high schoolers aren't listening to you in the first place. So... <clears throat> um. It just depends on what you're dealing with. Every age group of children is like a completely different world, uh, not just in how they act, but also in how they see the world around them and how they react. Remember, we talked about lifespan and development where um, adolescents, for example, teenagers, they have they, they tend to have a God complex where they just don't really think about their mortality. They're They're more inclined to do things that could be fatal because they don't understand the gravity of what that means what death means and everything they're not they don't have that thought they also tend to make their decisions and their priorities based off of how they look to their peers um the example that i used earlier in the class was the one time we had a we had a wreck and it was like a 17 year old girl driving and she was dying she was literally dying in the car and all she cared about was that her face wasn't messed up because she didn't want to have scars when she went back to school that was you know, like, ma'am, you are missing body parts, and this, that's just what she was worried about. It's important to remember that children are not small adults as far as their um, physiology goes. Remember, their vital signs are different. But um, when it comes to dealing with kids, you can still see them as that as far as um, size goes. If they're smaller, just think about that from a common sense standpoint. You're not going to give an adult dose of medication to somebody <clears throat> that's only the third of a a third the size of an adult. So the pediatrics, I don't want it to scare you. Again, this is not we're not you're not in a whole nother class, a whole nother world, but there's just some differences that I want you guys to be aware of when you're working on kids versus working on adults. Once you learn how to approach a child. Uh, based on their age and what to expect while you're caring for them, you'll find that treating children also offers some very special rewards. That's that's the truth. Nah, there's not a lot that feels better than coming back from helping somebody 
you know, a, a child. Um, but then there's also not a lot that's worse than coming back from a call where you weren't able to help the child. All right, caring for an infant or a child means that you must care for the parents and caregivers as well. And this is especially um, for first time parents. They're, this is their first kid. They're, they don't, they haven't possibly, even if it's their third, if it's their first time having an emergency, um, they can really freak out. And so your you may have a problem with the child, yes, but your biggest concern, or at least where you have to put most of your your attention, may be on calming the parents down, especially if they've never encountered this before in any way. Um, they see blood come from their child. They're, they're going to think immediately that the child may be dying and it is their fault and all this stuff is going through their heads. Um, and it may not really be anything more than just a a mild injury that the, you know the child's going to be fine, but they are just the end of the world for them. So you be calm because that will keep the parents calm. The more professional you are, the less you react like, oh my God, what happened here? The less the parents are going to freak out. So just remain calm, efficient, professional, and sensitive. Just a real quick growth and development recap. Many physical and emotional changes occur during childhood, and it's almost by the year. Um, childhood extends from birth until age 18. And the thoughts and behaviors of children as a whole are often grouped into five stages. We have infancy, which is your first year of life. Toddlers, one to three. Preschool age, three to six. School age kids are six to 12. And then adolescents are 13 to 18 years old. After that, they're considered an adult. Um, in multiple ways. They're adults medically, they're adults legally, all that. So for an infant, infancy is usually defined as the first year. Let me get to the right slide. There we go. The first month after birth is called the neonatal or newborn period, zero to two months. Um, infants less than two months spend most of their time sleeping or eating. And the biggest threats you're going to run into with this, you're going to be hypothermia if they get too cold. Um, if they choke on their food, formula, that kind of thing. The thing about choking on liquids, though, is that it's a lot of times it's gravity dependent, right? The infant gets laid down, starts gurgling and choking. Parents freak out, call 911, pick up the baby. By picking up the baby, they have fixed the emergency, uh, usually. And sometimes it's not the case, especially if the child aspirates the formula into their lungs or whatever. But for the most part, the choking, at least, is resolved. If it's can't really tell the difference between parents and strangers, which is a good thing, you don't have to worry about the whole stranger danger thing when you're dealing with infants. Um, and they're very reactive. They don't talk to you. Obviously, they don't know how to talk. So crying is their main mode of communication. And we aren't the parents. We're not used to hearing them cry. So we don't know if they're crying because they're hungry, crying because they're wanting a diaper change or or whatever. A lot of times what you'll wind up doing is asking the parent, is this cry normal for them? Um, if you've got kids or had kids and you've dealt with that, you tend to know when it sounds like they're crying because they want something or they're crying because they're in pain. There's more of a shriek to it if they're hurting. Um, and then also their cries should be energetic. If they sound like they're trying to cry, but they also sound like they're falling asleep on you at the same time, that's that's a problem, right? That's how you know that they're losing their consciousness. The cries should be forceful. They should be able to, they should be taking deep breaths, making some good sound. Um, and even though nobody wants to hear a baby cry, if it's an emergency, crying is a good thing. That means the baby's still got an airway. The baby is still able to draw a breath, um, make the noise, has an alert status, even though they can't communicate with you, they are still communicating. That's what the cry is. <laughs> There's a couple of reflexes that infants have, and then we can check these, especially when we're looking at levels of consciousness. So one, for example, is a sucking reflex for feeding. If you take your finger and brush it along their cheek, um, they will turn their head toward you like they're expecting to find something to suck on for food. If a nipple, be it from a bottle or whatever, gets into their mouth, they're immediately going to start sucking on it. A couple other things. If you put something in the palm of their hand, they should squeeze your hand. Um, if you pull their hands out to the side and let go, they'll kind of rebound back in. Uh, let's see. If you flip the bottom of their feet, their foot should kick away. It's not pain. 
that's what we're looking at when we are checking for responsiveness for CPR, right? Anybody remember when we talk about, hey, hey, are you okay? That kind of thing. Um, for the adults, we do the sternum rub or the, or the shoulder pinch, but for kids, we flick the bottom of their foot. It doesn't really cause pain. We're just checking for a reflex response. Head control is limited. They really don't have a lot of control. That's why um, if we're having to do CPR or whatever, a lot of times we have to hold the head. They are very predisposed to hypothermia. Babies should be swaddled, covered up, kept warm, that kind of thing. And sometimes they're just not. It's, it's Sometimes it could be accidental. Sometimes it could just be neglect. Sometimes they may be covered up, but um, maybe they got wet or it's just that cold in the room. So not everything is going to be child abuse, but keep an eye out for that just in case. Two to six months, infants become more active. Um, this is good because it makes them easier to evaluate. You can definitely, by this point, you can look at mom and dad and say, is that normal? And they'll tell you. They do spend more time awake. They'll smile at you and make eye contact. If you make funny faces at them, they'll, they'll get real big grins. Um, they do recognize caregivers at this point, but they still don't really have that stranger complex that we that gets instilled into them. They just know who mom and dad are. Um, they still have that strong sucking reflex because they're still drinking from the bottle or whatever. And they do have active extremity movement. They're not really stuck in that fetal curl anymore. And they'll have another, they'll still have a vigorous cry. They'll follow objects with their eyes up to a few feet away. Uh, they like, I think at this stage, they can see to the other side of the room, especially when they get to the end of this stage. They'll have an increased awareness of surroundings and they'll use both hands and feet to examine it, examine objects. They'll also start trying to put things in their mouth at this point because they're going to start to teeth. About 70% of infant, infants will sleep through the night by six months. If they're not, that's not a problem. That's just that child doesn't. Um, they'll begin to roll over, which is great. They're starting to try to move around. And they still use crying um, to communicate. But if it's persistent crying, if they're irritable or lack of eye contact, these can be serious in indicators of a serious illness or some kind of like depressed mental state or even just a delay in development. But that's not... That's not really in our wheelhouse, so don't worry about delays in development. The big thing is if you want them to be crying vigorously if something's wrong, and, um, and even if nothing is wrong or you can't really figure out if something is wrong, if they're crying, you at least know that your, your primary is good, right? Because, again, they have to have an airway and breathing or they won't be able to draw in the breath to make a good cry. Six to 12 months. During this stage, your infants will begin to babble. They're trying to talk to you, but they hadn't quite figured out their words yet. Um, by the end of this stage, usually they do have one or two words. That's pretty good. They'll learn to sit. They may be crawling. I know that when my son was this age, he was crawling, but he was stuck in reverse. So he would kind of, he would scoot himself across the room trying to crawl forward, but he could only go backwards. He'd back himself into a corner and then get upset. So he would just turn him around, put his face in the corner. And then watch him scoot backwards across the room again. Um, the biggest problem with this is, though, is that as they start to walk and stuff like that, they're going to um, potentially get into things that they shouldn't be able to get into. So parents that have houses that may not, like, for example, have the little child locks on their cabinet doors, um, kids may be able to get into the cleaning supplies that are under the sink, that kind of thing. So you may start seeing poisoning calls at this point. If they weren't teething before, they're definitely going to be teething now. So a lot of the exploration of their world is by putting it in their mouth. Um, that's a couple of things. They will um, sometimes chewing on things or gnawing on things will help to ease the that feeling as, as their teeth are coming in. But they're also, that's just how they're exploring. They want to know what it tastes like. What does it feel like? Can they bite it? Can they, is it? Is it edible? Is it something they can try to eat? That kind of thing. Um, they will definitely cry more when they're separated from their parents or caregivers. It's called separation anxiety. And sometimes they don't come out of this for a while. I remember two and three year olds, four, five year olds, whatever, that would cry like they were being abandoned every time they, they got dropped off at the uh, daycare. 
So if you're assessing a child in this age or anywhere in the next couple of age groups, um, have mom and dad nearby. It's when they start trying to develop their independence and get away from mom and dad, that's when you want to try to assess them away from their parents. But when they're early childhood, early to mid childhood, you can keep mom and dad or, or whoever the caregiver is, uh, keep them close by. Your assessment doesn't start when you get to your patient, though. Your assessment starts from across the room. When you, when we're going to talk about the pediatric assessment triangle or the PAT, um, the minute you lay eyes on the baby or child or whatever, there's a couple things I want you to look for. And it's basically your primary assessment. You want to know, does it, first of all, do they look like they're dying? All right. Skin's ashen. They look limp, passed out, these kind of things. Um, then I also want you to look, does it look like they are having a hard time breathing? Um, it, breathing should be effortless Effortless for a child. If it looks like they're struggling to breathe or you see that seesaw breathing in their abdomen, that's a problem. All right. And then also their skin color. So is it warm pink skin or, oh, I'm sorry, is it pink skin? Does it look like it's got good blood supply? Because when blood starts getting shunted for whatever reason, the GI tract and your skin are the first things to lose blood flow. You can't see the GI tract, but you can see skin. So if they're pale, cool, clammy, they look like they're just leaking out water and there's no, they look like they've seen a ghost is one way of putting it. Um, that means that their skin has lost its blood flow, which means that that blood has been diverted somewhere or it's just been lost. If you're worried about internal bleeding, depending on if it's a, a trauma call or that kind of thing. Um, if you have to do something that's painful, do it at the end of the assessment, because the minute you inflict any kind of pain, you've lost any trust and cooperation from that child. So if you know you got to do it, do everything else first. If you can warm your stethoscope up so that it doesn't shock them when you touch them with it, that helps. Uh, something that I've been able to do that's, that's really helped is anything that I'm going to use in my assessment, I let the baby play with it first. Like while I'm, if I'm checking other vitals, and I know I'm going to need a blood pressure. I'll go ahead and set the cuff down in front of them and everything and like hand it to them like, here, do you want to play with this? That kind of thing. So they can touch it how they want to. They can explore it and see what it does, see that it's not going to bite them. Um, and then when I'm ready for it, I'll ask for it back, kind of, you know, take it back, put it on and I'll explain what I'm doing, make sure mom knows, all that stuff. And um, even though your baby may not understand you because they're not talking yet, um, as long as you are calm and soothing and you're in how you're saying things, that's all they need. They know that you're not, you're not being threatening, that kind of thing. So they don't understand what you're saying. Mom does, but uh, the child just knows that you're not a threat and that's huge. All right. For your toddler after infancy until three years of age. So one to three child's a toddler. These are also known as a terrible twos, all that good stuff. Um, for 12 to 18 months, toddlers begin to walk and explore during this period. They should be getting pretty good at that at this point. They're able to open doors, drawers, boxes, bottles, get into things, all the stuff they shouldn't be getting into. They can do it now. Because they're explorers by nature and they're not yet afraid of things, they haven't really been burned by fire, bitten by things, that kind of thing. Injuries in this group um, get pretty common. Toddlers begin to imitate the behavior of older children and adults. So if you walk in the room and they shout an F word at you, you can pretty well know they got that from somewhere. Um, know your major body parts. Uh, they know your major body parts when you point on. So like if you want to know if their arm's hurting, you can point at your arm and he's like, does this hurt? And then, or, you know, whatever your assessment is. Um, their vocabulary is increasing, but usually it's still pretty basic. And because they don't have molars yet, teeth grow from the front and then around to the side. Um, they may not be able to fully chew their food, but first time parents may not know that. So first time parent tries to give them a piece of steak and they don't have the right teeth to chew that steak. They could choke on it. That kind of thing. 18 to 12 months. Uh, the mind is starting to develop very rapidly. Kids get very smart in this stage. Or at least they get much more aware of what's going on around them. Their vocabulary is going to jump from about 10 to 15 words to 100. So they'll be able to talk a lot more. Uh, they'll be able to name a common object if you point to it. So, you know, they may not know the name of what it is you want to know. Did you trip over your bike? And they're like, well, I don't know what a bike is. You point at it. 
and they were like, oh yeah, you know, that got, that got me or something like that. Um, toddlers do begin to understand cause and effect. So they, are, they start to understand, you know, if I put my hand in the fire, it's going to burn me, that kind of thing. Um, but because of that, they will also develop a lot of fears at this stage. If they put their hand in hot water and it burns them, they're going to think that water will burn them and they're going to want to shy away from the tub, shy away from the bathroom, you know, that kind of thing. So um, sometimes you may run into that where you're like, why is this child so afraid of this? And something, you know, and it could have been an accident. It's like I said, not everything is abuse. But um, if they got burned accidentally by some hot water, then they're probably not going to want to get near the water. If they fell down the stairs, they're probably not going to want to deal with the stairs, that sort of thing. They do tend to run and climb more often. Uh, little spider monkeys that don't understand if they climb up to the ceiling and fall, it's going to hurt them. They just want to get up to the ceiling. Toddlers at this stage tend to cling to their parents or caregivers and often have an object that comforts them. So it can be a toy, a blanket, whatever. And they are starting to get that stranger danger feel at this point. So um, when you're dealing with toddlers up for the next few years, you're going to have to understand and, and try your best to avoid that, you know, you're a stranger. I don't want to talk to you. And hopefully the, the mom or the dad will will assist you in that. So they may have stranger anxiety. Let me get to the right. There we go. They may have stranger anxiety. They may resist separation from the caregiver, which is perfectly fine with me. If mom wants to hold on to the baby, unless it's a trauma where I need to do some kind of um, stabilization, by all means, let mom and dad hold the kid. So if that helps, do that. If mom and dad aren't there, but let's say they're at school, um, like play school or something like that, if they've got an object or toy there that they find comfort in, you can let them hold that. Um, something that we do on the ambulance, and it's, it's worked sometimes and it hasn't worked in others, it just depends. But if you give them, if you keep a stuffed animal on the truck, then when you go to these calls, you can go in with that gift. Like, hey, I have something for you, that kind of thing. Um, that gives them something nice and soft to hold on to. Um, they can find some comfort in that and it'll get you through your call. All right, so they may be unhappy about being restrained or held for procedures. If you can get mom or dad to hold them for these, that'll help a lot. For you, as EMTs, the usually the procedures that you're going to be doing are going to be things like bone stabilization if they've broken a bone, um, or just something as basic as giving them oxygen. It may not be that big of a thing. Higher levels of care may have to do an IV. Um, that's something that actually inflicts pain, so it's much more precarious for them, but uh, it just depends. So you can use visual clues or the Wong Baker faces pain scale. Is that on this? No, it's not on this slide. Okay. Uh, basically, that's your, you know, for adults, we're like, hey, man, zero to 10. 10 being you got shot in the face with your own shotgun. Where, you, where, where do you place your pain? Um, for kids, they don't really understand that. They may not look like, especially at toddler age, they probably can't even count to 10. Um, so just use their facial clues if they're grimacing. If they're just straight out, like bawling their eyes out, that would be extreme. If it's a mild grimace, that'd probably be like more of a four or a five, that kind of thing. If they're smiling at you or not even paying you any attention, like nothing's going on, then it's more of a zero. They can be distracted by a toy. Persistent crying or ir irritability can be a symptom of serious illness or injury. And um, if they've been hurt before or if another EMT has... Or I'm going to say betrayed them, even though it may not be any fault of the EMT. Um, if like, let's say they had gotten, in, they got hurt before and they got an IV and they remember that needle stick. When they see you, they're going to think of that and they're not, they may not like you. Um, sometimes you're just screwed walking in the door, but do the best you can. Ages three to six. They're getting better at talking. Um, this is where they actually start to pretty much master the language. So it gets better. Children can walk and run and will begin throwing, catching, kicking, you know, doing sports and stuff. And at this age, they also tend to be at right about the same height as the, as the dining room table. So, you know, they're hauling ass through the, through the house and run 
head first into the side of the table because they didn't see it. Sometimes you'll run into that problem. Um, toilet training is mastered at this age, usually somewhere around in here. They'll have a rich imagination and they can be fearful about pain. They've most likely had some pain by this point for one reason or another, and they don't want to get hurt again. Um, if they think they got hurt for doing something wrong, a lot of times they will use that imagination to try to tell you some off the wall thing about what happened to try to save themselves from getting in trouble. Sometimes they'll throw tantrums, not usually for you, but they'll do it for mom and dad. Foreign body aspiration, airway obstructions continue to be a high risk. Um, not so much because they're doing things out of curiosity, but because they, you know, three to six years old, you're like, yeah, you can have that piece of candy. And so they're eating the candy and then they choke on it. I had a, I had a problem with uh, peppermints and Jolly Ranchers when I was a kid. I think I choked on at least three of them. All right, they can understand directions and be specific in describing painful areas. Despite increased ability to communicate, a lot of the history is still going to be given by the caregivers because they're just not going to understand what you're asking. It's usually the case. Um, when it comes for your assessment, appeal to their imagination. Sometimes that'll help. Communicate clearly. Don't lie to the patient. Of, um, a lot of times if they catch you in it, you can you can toss any ability to get trust out the window. They're gonna they're not gonna believe you. Um, so if if a procedure is gonna hurt, say that you've got a paramedic there. He's getting ready to do an IV, and the patient's talking to you and not the paramedic. Because sometimes that happens. You walk in as a team. The patient, being a child, may like you, but not like that big bad paramedic, right? He, you don't like him. He, he scary looking or whatever. Um, the child may only want to talk to you. So if the paramedic's going to do something that's going to hurt him, don't tell the child it's not going to hurt. Because when it does hurt, the child's not going to believe you anymore. And that's not good for anybody. Um, if you're going to do a head-to-toe on children, particularly this age children, so anything from um, three to six, toddlers, two to six, whatever, it's not so much set in stone that you're in this age range. But if you're dealing with small kids, because they don't necessarily want to trust you right out the gate, start your assessment at the feet. I know that all through the class we've said head to toe, but for little kids, just do toe to head. Because if you start poking at the head, you freak them out. They're not going to want you to get anywhere near the rest of them. So start at the feet. It's the least um, threatening way to start. And so they know because you didn't hurt their feet, you're probably not going to hurt them anywhere else, that kind of thing. Use adhesive bandages to cover the site of an injection or another small wound, even though that is bleeding control bandages. Um, they're fantastic emotionally for kids, right? They that will that will solve a broken bone as far as the kid's concerned. Modesty does start to develop at this age, so keep them covered, keep them, keep them um just keep their dignity in in place as best you can. Just remember that. All right, let's see. For your school ages, uh, we're talking about six to 12 year olds. So as you can see now, um, the growth is starting to slow because when we started off, we were talking about zero to 12 months, I'm sorry, zero to six months, six to 12, one to three, three to six. Now we're doing six to 12. Um, children at this age are beginning to act more like adults. So if you have to treat them, it would benefit you greatly to treat them like adults even if they're acting like spoiled little babies um just because you got to have you need to get a good assessment out of them and you need good honest answers out of them um if you come across like dear old dad or whatever they're probably not going to want to talk to you not only that um if they do give you quite answers they may not be honest but they can think in concrete terms their critical thinking may not be there. They say that a lot of your real critical thinking doesn't fully develop until your 20s, uh, but they can still definitely think in black and white, you know, concrete terms, things like that. They'll respond sensibly to questions. They can help take care of themselves, even if they can't do it all on their own. School's important at this age, and they do start to worry about popularity. I know that popularity kind of became a thing 
when I was in school, I think around second grade, first or second grade, um, just at the school that I was at in Bay Springs. And then it only got worse from there, no matter where I went, because we were getting older, right? And then that's pretty much the name of the game when you get to be teenagers. But um, children with chronic illnesses or disabilities can become self-conscious about fitting in, even if it's something that nobody has any clue about. They're worried because it, you know, maybe they have a birthmark or a rash or something, and it's something that is covered up by clothes. There's no chance of it being seen, but because they know about it, they're going to be just, oh my God, can't can't let anybody else find out about it. Um, I don't know what that's supposed to say. Is your cat typing for you? <laughs> I thought so. All right. Anyway, um, children do begin to understand death at this point. They do understand that death is final. Um, they, depending on if they are growing up in church or non-religious families or whatever, their ideas of what comes afterward or what death means um, may vary. But they still know that death is pretty much the end of this world for everybody. And then what comes next is just up to up to who you you know what house you're walking into. Um, but because they understand what it is, this could also increase their anxiety about an illness or an injury. So if they think that something's going to kill them, they don't have that that um, God complex yet that they get when they become teenagers. But so they they do think, okay, what if you know I could die? What will this do? I don't I'm not ready for that yet. That kind of thing. Assessment begins to be more like an adult assessment at this stage, so head to toe. To help gain their trust, talk to the child, not the caregiver. You can have the caregiver give the answers, that's fine, um, but direct your questions to the child. So look at the kid. Don't don't look at mom. Don't treat, don't treat the situation like the child's not there, even at six years old, uh, especially these days. Six-year-olds are... They're like, I'm right here. I can tell you how my pain feels. I think there was a commercial I saw where the little girl was like, I'm five years old now, mother. I read. I watch the news. Anyway, so child's probably familiar with the process of a physical exam. If they've ever been hurt before, they know. Plus, they've been to the doctor, right? So at six years, they're in school. So they've had to go to assessments from the doc every year, get booster shots. They're not. They're not unfamiliar with getting those they know what needles are um and that may or may not help you it could be it could wind up being a, a bit of a hindrance or it could be a walk in the park it just depends on how they see it start with the head work to the feet as you would an adult and if possible give the child choices for example you know um do you want to sit up or lie down if they can do that if it's something that's going to danger put them in danger if they sit up then obviously don't ask them that but if it doesn't matter, let them let them make the decision and just make it. It's inconsequential things, um, but it gives them a choice. It gives them a little bit of independence, I guess you could say. Um, but it's not questions where it's like not. It's not like you're saying, "Would you? Do you want to take this medicine or not?" All right, because no kid wants to take medicine, and they might need it. But um, Things like sitting up and laying down, if it doesn't matter, if you're not worried about C-spine, then screw it. Let them do what they want. Would you like to take off your clothes yourself? Um, if it's trauma and we're having to do it head to toe, you still got to get them trauma naked. If they're awake, then it probably would be very, very awkward for you to take their clothes off. Let them do it. Uh, and you can tell them, like, all right, I got to look at, I got to assess everything. We're going to start with your from your waist up. So can you pull your shirt up around your shoulders? All right, great. You know, can you lean forward? Let me take a look at your back with your shirt up around your shoulders. Great. All right, you can put your shirt back in place. All right, here's a sheet. I'm going to cover you up. I need you to, um, you know, adjust your pants so that I can look at your legs and all that stuff. And the sheet just keeps them dignity, keeps their dignity and keeps their privacy. It's the easiest way to do it. 
Um, if they're unconscious, obviously, you have to treat that like any other unconscious person, which means clothes are getting cut off. You can let a child listen to his or her own heartbeat through the through the stethoscope. A lot of times that'll help because you're letting the child see what you're trying to do. That can be something pretty cool for them, which will keep their interest in what you're doing from a curiosity standpoint. And it won't just be, oh my God, I'm getting poked and prodded by some weird guy. Give them an example or give them simple explanations about what's causing their pain. If you try to tell them something and you're going off on it like you're like you're in class or talking to a doctor, you, <laughs> you will see eyes blaze over and they're not going to understand a word you're saying. You'll probably do the same thing to mom and dad. So, you know, you can just say hurt. You can say guts, stuff, arm, um, fast, you know, heartbeat, whatever. You don't have to slow. Use common common terms. Use what you would have used in chapter one before you learned your medical terms. All right, for adolescents, these are the fun ones. Most adolescents are able to think abstractly, uh, still not really critically, but they can start to get, con they can be conceptual uh, and they can participate in decision-making. Personal morals begin to develop if they haven't already. And they're able to discriminate between what's right and wrong. A lot of this is still, you know, a parrot of what their parents taught them. But because they are becoming more independent, uh, potentially rebellious, that kind of thing, a lot of times you may start to see where they may not say it out loud, but you can definitely tell that they don't agree with something their parents were saying. Um, so, you know, mom sitting there going, oh, no, you know, little Susie would never do that. She knows that's wrong. And little Susie's sitting there like, yeah. <laughs> uh, physically, they're similar to adults. They're just a little bit smaller. But at this stage of the game, you're going to find that their vital signs tend to be just like a grown up. Um, their size will be just like an adult. Their sexual regions, everything's going to be just like an adult because at this point they're past or at least they're they're at puberty so um everything's going to be in place everything's going to be pretty much fully functional and if they don't already know what that means and they're probably going to be very curious about it interest in romantic relationships will begin and this is the stage where puberty begins so with this comes a hell of a lot of insecurities um guys voices are deepening which means that they're they're actually talking in like three different octaves at the same time every you know throughout a sentence every okay. time their voice cracks up a note they're gonna they're gonna not want to say anything um girls start paying more attention to their weight the the you know what curves are there and which curves aren't there and all that stuff so when you're doing a head to toe assessment um proceed with caution I highly recommend having a commensurate gender take care of that. So if it's, if it's a 16 year old girl, for example, I would just, unless the girl's gonna die before somebody shows up, um, if I've got the time for it, I will radio for a truck with a female EMT or paramedic to come out. It's just, it's, it's better all around. Um, during this time, they're gonna start taking more risk, risky behavior and experimentation because they feel indestructible. That's going to be a big, a big thing there. They're going to start to struggle with independence. They're going to want that control because they feel like they're grown, but they still live at home with mom and dad, so they may not have it. Body image is going to be a huge thing, sexuality and peer pressure. And, you know, the sad thing, too, um, a lot of them will, sus will be susceptible to peer pressure and not even realize it. Um, most people don't realize they're being manipulated by their friends and their friends don't even realize they're doing it to them. Usually sometimes they do, but, um, they care so much about what other people think that they don't realize they don't have original thoughts. They're just, they're looking at what their friends are doing or what they're seeing on TV and they want so badly to be liked. And that's what's popular that that becomes what their thought process is. And with that comes things like, why did you set your hair on fire? Because you saw it on a TikTok video or something like that. Um, like you realize that guy had some kind of um, liquid on his hand where the liquid was burning and not his hand. Instead, you just set your hand on fire, that sort of thing. Uh, they may have mood swings or depression. 
hormones are huge at this stage. And again, I hate I hate that people ever took the term hormonal and made it an insult because that's a real thing, right? Um, they're going to be hormonal from the changes from puberty. If a, if a girl is being put on birth control, then the birth control is going to make her hormonal from the shift that comes with that. Um, I've seen teenage girls laugh and cry at the same time. And as creepy as that is, I know what it is. I know why. It's just really scary. Um, I had one that was crying and she was laughing because she's like, I'm happy and I don't know why I'm crying, but she was just uncontrollably crying. Adolescents can often understand very complex concepts and treatment options, which is great because now you're talking to them more like an adult and they would appreciate that. But at the same time, don't lose them in the jargon. Um, provide them with information when they request it. Treat them like adults. Understand, though, that if they're not 18, they, they don't get the final decision unless they're emancipated. You can allow adolescents to be involved in their own care. So if it's something they need to do and it helps, you can just hand it to them. Like, here, um, you need to take this. You know, instead of you trying to throw it down their throat, let them, let them take it. You can provide choices while lending guidance, depending on what it is, as long as they're alert. An EMT of the same gender should definitely perform the physical exam if possible. If not, if it's, you know, they're bleeding out or you're, you're worried that they might and you just don't have time to sit there and wait 20 minutes for a female to show up, well, have a witness. It's best, the next best thing. Um, we already talked about risk-taking behavior being very common. A lot of times they just don't think about the fact that they could die. Right. So they'll they'll do things that sound fun. And that's as far as their consideration goes. Um, yeah, if they jump off a bridge, you're going to jump too. Uh, that depends. What's at the bottom of the bridge? <laughs> Let's see. Risk can also also result in unintentional trauma, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, unprotected sex and teen pregnancy, which um, I think we're number one in the world for that. Female patients are, it says they may be pregnant. Female patients should be considered pregnant until proven otherwise. So you can ask them, get them in the truck if you need to, and ask them when they're not with their parents breathing down their neck. But even if they still tell you no, just assume that they are. The treatments that you give in the field don't really change whether they're pregnant or not. So it's okay to just make that assumption, maybe not out loud, but just keep it in mind. If you really do think they are pregnant, though, outside of that little corp, um, let the receiving facility know. If they're showing signs that they might be pregnant, point that out. All right. So bumping up to your anatomy and physiology. Now that we're done with our lifespan development. The body is growing and changing rapidly during childhood, and there are some physical differences. For example, children's heads are much bigger in relation to the rest of their body as compared to an adult, which is going to change a couple of things physically, not just within them, but also in mechanisms of injury. Uh, if a child falls from 10 feet up and he's a two-year-old, probably going to land on his head because his head's still heavier than the body and he's got enough room between him and the ground, he's going to invert. If um, if it's more like a 10 or 12 year old, well, now they're, they're taller, their bodies, the weight of their body is caught up. So they're much more likely to land on their feet, not to mention that's what they're going to try to do. Um, and they usually think that if they land on their feet, they're going to be OK, but they don't understand the whole idea of, you know, bending at the knees to absorb the shock. They're likely to have popped their hip, you know, broke their hip, um, pop their legs out of joint, that kind of thing. So depending on what you're looking at, think about what the different um body shapes and, and where the weight distribution is for for kids at whatever age it is you're dealing with think about how that's going to affect a mechanism of injury or how a mechanism of injury would affect that rather um kids with big old heads a lot of times when they get hit their neck is much more likely to be damaged because their head the, the neck it just can't hold that much weight hadn't been that developed For the respiratory system, the anatomy of the pediatric airway differs slightly from adults. For one thing, the pediatric airway is smaller in diameter and is shorter in length. 
And that's going to be the case for pretty much every body system for a child versus an adult. There's really not anything that's the full size, obviously. Uh, the lungs are smaller, so you don't need as much air if you're using a BVM. The heart is higher in the child's chest. There's also a gland, a very large gland that sits on top of the heart that um, as the child gets older and becomes more of an adult, we lose it. It just it just goes away. We, you know, whatever. It's called the thymus. Um, and with that means that that's another, just think about it in, in the point of if they take chest trauma and it's now they're bleeding into the chest or something like that, you have another object there that's already taking up space. So um, if, the, if a child ever pops a lung, they're going to start to put pressure on their good lung faster because there's less space to begin with. Just something to think about. The occiput is larger and rounder, which is their, the back of their head. Um, this requires more careful positioning of the airway. We talk about it in CPR. When you go to open up a child's airway, everybody learns to head tilt, chin lift. When you guys go to basic in a few weeks, holy crap, it's getting close. Um, when you open a child's airway, I don't want you to crank their head all the way back like you do an adult. If you do that, the base of the skull, the occiput, is going to put pressure on the back of the uh, airway, and it'll pinch it off. So as you can see in this picture, the, the adult's head is cranked way back. The child's head, however, is almost just neutral, right? It's barely raised. You can basically, if you were to do this in reality, you could take a towel, a, a wash rag, something of that sort, fold it up, stick it underneath their neck and their shoulders, and then just let their head kind of fall back from it. Um, puts them in kind of a sniffing position, and it does a lot better for keeping their airway where you want it. All right. Larger rounder occiput, we already talked about that. Uh, children have a long, floppy, U shaped epiglottis, so it's bigger. Um, if it start, if they do develop epiglottitis, because that's in their upper airway, which is close to their tongue, uh, when it swells, the body physiologically might mistake it for food. And it's not, I'm not meaning that like it's going to swallow, they're going to try to swallow their epiglottis, but, um, what it's going to do is it's going to cause their salivary glands to start producing saliva because it, the mouth thinks it's got food in it, um, which means that they're going to start to drool a lot. That's a big sign that a child might have epiglottitis is because that they're, they're drooling a lot because the body thinks that that swollen epiglottis is something that needs to be digested. They do have less developed rings of cartilage in the trachea. Um, those things stiffen up as they get older, but they need to be soft because they're still growing. They do provide some protection, but not a whole lot. So if they get hit in the airway, they're much more likely to take damage there than an adult would. The diameter of the trachea in infants is about the same as a drinking straw to the point where if we have to, as paramedics, we put an airway in like an ET tube in, a, in an infant's throat, a lot of them don't even have cuffs on them. There's no need. It's just a tiny little little plastic tube. We just slide it in and that's all we do. Um, the airway is, is easily obstructed by secretions, blood, swelling, food, that sort of thing. Infants are nose breathers and they may require suctioning and airway maintenance. So the reason being is because their accessory muscles and everything haven't really been built up all the way yet. So they tend to breathe through their nose and they, we call them belly breathers because the biggest um, mechanical portion of their breathing is their diaphragm. So when it pulls down, um, that's how they take their breath. Their intercostal muscles haven't really developed yet. And because it takes some effort to move that diaphragm, a lot of times they will actually just poke their gut out and kind of move the diaphragm that way. So when a child takes a breath, it looks like they're, we call it belly breathing, their belly is coming out. Whereas an adult, if an adult's breathing right, you're actually looking for chest rise. So there's a difference there. Respiratory rates higher in kids. Um, I always say 25 to 50 for an infant, 15 to 30 for a child. Um, this says 20 to 60. Um, as long as you're in that ballpark, you're okay. Different books will say different things. 
We did CPR on a four month on Sunday and the medic said they don't do any type of lower airway in the field anymore. Is that right? Um, okay, so yeah, they've been pushing away from that. Actually, yes, that's that is true. If he was re if he was refreshed recently, then yeah. Not to mention, um, what am I thinking? Med control for for a lot of ambulances now. Med control is already starting to take that away. It is there if they need it, but they're heavily heavily dissuaded from doing it because the risk of infection is very big. And that's becoming a that's becoming a problem. Um, a lot of times we we discount infection and sepsis in EMS because it's not our problem, right? You know, we're going to have another hospital long before an infection becomes a deal. However, just because that's the case doesn't mean the hospital is going to be able to help them if they get that infection. So, if we can avoid giving it to them, that increases their chance of survival. And that's that's the way we need to be thinking about it anyway. Just because it's it's like. Um, setting up a steroid drip for somebody with respiratory issues, that stuff doesn't really take effect for like two hours way after we give them to the hospital. But because it doesn't take effect for two hours, why not go ahead and get a head start on it? It's just better for the patient. Not everything we give is for us to see the benefit. It's just for the, the patient. But yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, that is new and it's becoming more and more common. Some of your ambulance companies may, your paramedics may still be doing it. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to push back on that. It's going the way of the longboard. They're, they're thinking that it causes more harm than good sometimes. All right. Children have an oxygen demand twice that of an adult. So they breathe more. All right. And remember, even though, um, yeah, I'm not surprised. The Cadian's pretty quick on making changes when when new trends come out. It's one of the good things about them. But um, children breathe faster. They need more oxygen. And even though when we're doing BLS, like CPR kind of BLS on the child, we still do it the same way we do an adult where it's CAB, compressions, airway, breathing. Um, we still try to give them as much air as we can. That's why we have the 15 to two ratio if you have more than one rescuer. It's because we're trying to give them more air. If we did just did 30 to two, um, they would only get half the breaths. If we cut the 15 to two, you give them twice as many. It, it benefits them more. But your patients are gonna be at an increased risk of hypoxia. Remember I told you that the, um, the diaphragm is the primary muscle mover for breathing? So you're going to see them kind of belly breathe. Gastric distension can interfere with movement of the diaphragm and lead to hypoventilation. If for whatever reason, say you're bagging a child, if you are not giving the, if, if you don't have a good airway or you're over inflating and you're pushing air into the stomach, it winds up making it that much harder for them to breathe. Um, Cause when the stomach inflates and the stomach sits right under the diaphragm, the diaphragm can't move down. The stomach won't allow it to move, and then they can't breathe. They don't have the intercostal muscles. So if you stop the diaphragm, you've stopped pretty much 90% of their breathing capability right there. Oh. I thought I went the wrong way. All right. The circulatory system, uh, it's important to know the normal pulse ranges when evaluating children. So adults, 60 to 100, right? Um, kids, just think of it, the smaller they are, the higher the number. It's the same thing for all their vital signs except blood pressure. So, you know, if it's a kid, they're going to breathe faster. Their pulse is going to be faster, all that. An infant's heart rate can beat up to 100 times, I'm sorry, 160 times a minute. Um Again, the numbers that I remembered in school, and, and this is just ballpark, I remember 100 to 150 is normal. 160 is not far from that. If you remember my numbers and you get, um, if the question on the registry wants you to know that they're tachycardic, the number will be severely tachycardic. They're not going to give you something in a gray range. If they do, they want you to assume that it's okay. So if it's easier for you to remember 100 to 150, you can do that. Um, if the number that the registry gives you is supposed to be tachycardic, it'll be something like 180 or, you know, 20 or 30 points higher. Um, 
anyway, a patient's heart rate is they're pretty much one trick ponies. Everything they need to do as far as be it compensate for shock, move more oxygen, um, anything they need to do to increase their perfusion is going to be their heart rate. So, you know, that's why paramedics, we can, as an adult, if adult goes into shock, we can give them a couple different things to try to pull them out of shock. We can dopamine, epinephrine, whatever. Uh, infants and, and children, small children, it's just epi. All we do is try to increase their heart rate because that's the only thing that really helps them out. That's all they got. But that's also why um, when they're in shock, their compensation tends to look great for a long time and then it just drops off. It's because they, they don't have a they don't have a plan B or a plan C like we do. They just have plan A. And plan A trucks along just fine until it doesn't. And when it falls, there's nothing left. They just fall off a cliff and now they're dead. Um, that's the scary thing. So if you're looking at shock in an infant, um, you're really looking for a faster than normal heart rate. If they have taken an injury and you think they're bleeding um, profusely or either internally or they've lost a lot of blood externally, and you want to know if they're going into shock, look at their pulse rate. If they're beaten at the top end of this range um, at the least, but most likely it'd be like 180, even up to like 200 at the, at the, at the peak of it. Um, that's a major sign of shock. So treat that. All right. Don't let it, don't wait for them to decompensate because when they get to that point, they're going to die on you if you don't do something. Remember, a, an infant doesn't have to just have a pulse rate to be considered good. If they have less than one beat a second, anything less than 60, they need to be getting compressions. Their heart rate needs to sit that high that 60 beats a minute, which is perfectly fine for an adult. Um, 60 beats a minute is not enough to sustain an infant. They'll die. So you'll be doing compressions at that point. Blood flow to the extremities will diminish when they go into shock. So that's another sign. You're going to have a, a fast, a fast heart rate, but their skin is going to be cool and clammy and they're going to have, they're going to lose that two second cap refill that usually is really, really pretty steady in kids. If they have good perfusion, they should have that cap refill under two seconds. Um, Again, I don't take that with, as law. If it's two and a half seconds, it doesn't mean they're dying. It just means they just have a two and a half second cap refill. If you check it and then you check it again and now you're at three seconds or four seconds, well, now there's your problem, right? You're trending down at that point. There's just your, your pulse ranges. Um, again, I'd say 60 to 100 for adults, um, 80 to 120. For kids, this has 60 to 140, so that's an even bigger range. And then 100 to 150 for infants, and then newborns can even be, neonates can be higher than that. For your nervous system, compared to the adult nervous system, the pediatric system is immature, underdeveloped, and not well protected. The biggest thing is it is not well protected. The nervous system is there. It's fully functional, um, just like an adult's. So if you poke them, they're going to feel it, right? You you flick a reflex, they're going to they're going to respond to it. That kind of thing. All that's there. Um, it's just a, like their spine may not be 100% fused, or not fused, but 100% formed. So they're more risk of having the spine injured if they have. I think it's spina bifida where some of the spine is exposed um that's an issue that that infants have now granted a lot of times they'll see that um in the ultrasounds and in the testing before birth but you may run into that in the field they're more prone to head injuries from falls or motor vehicle crashes like i said think of it like bobbleheads right they're much bigger on top than they are on bottom the neck isn't necessarily designed to take a hit like that where the head gets bumped around um, so if you're dealing with a child in a car wreck, a lot of times you're going to, this is a big issue for you. You're going to be worried about this, trying to make sure that their neck isn't too damaged because of what would have been maybe not that big of a deal if they were an adult. It could have been a mild accident, but a mild accident will do a lot of damage to a child. The subarachnoid space inside the skull is relatively smaller, leaving less cushioning for the brain. That grows as they grow. So 
if they do get into a wreck or something hits their head, um, that cushion's not necessarily they're more likely to, to hurt their brain, have a brain bruise or a brain bleed than they would if they were an adult. Even though the bones are there, the bones aren't the end all be all. You still got to have a cushion on the inside. The brain tissue and cerebral vasculature are fragile. Um, if they take that hit and if the brain does move inside them, they're very high risk of shearing veins and vessels, which is going to cause a lot of bleeding. Right. So think back to your TBI chapter where we talked about the arteries being along the outside close to the skull. The veins are on the inside closer to the brain. Um, and we already we talked about it there. I mean, that's a that's a threat for adults, but it's even more so for children. So if it's a traumatic injury where they hit their head. I want that chapter to come to the front of your mind because they're more susceptible. They're more likely to have those problems with less of an MOI than what an adult would have. And a lot of times that's actually something that does get missed a lot. We all learn about TBIs, but almost nobody considers it in the field. Not until they start showing signs. And at that point, you're way behind the curveball. All right. Pediatric brain also requires a higher amount of cerebral blood flow. Oxygen and glucose and does the adult brain. So if something gets out of whack, be it they get hypoxic or um, their blood sugar gets out of, out of whack, they're going to start to have mental issues much faster than an adult. An adult gets hyp uh, hypoglycemic, for example, they're not going to go straight into coma. They're going to get this antsy feeling. They might get some anxiety and I don't know what's going on and I, I just feel weird. Um, I need to eat something. Child might go from... I feel great to knocked out because it, they, they have such a smaller window of what the brain can handle. Spinal cords are less common. I'm sorry, spinal cord injuries are less common in pediatric patients. Usually it's more of the brain. Um, if it is going to be a spinal cord injury, it's going to be in the C-spine. It's more likely to be an injury to the ligaments because of a fall. So it's going to wind up being more about the, uh, the ligaments that hold the spine, like the different vertebrae together. For a suspected neck injury, perform manual inline stabilization or follow local protocols like normal. All right, we're going to take a 10 minute break uh, ish. Y'all can come back in 10. If I get back early, I'm going to start a little bit sooner, but just because there is so much to this chapter, I'm going to try to keep the breaks a little short. I may do, I'll tell you what, let's do five minutes and I'll just give you more breaks instead of doing them at the, at the hours. So be back in five, which is 10 after.
All right, that took a little bit longer than I expected, but we're going to get back on it. Actually, hold that thought. Okay, now let's try this again. So for the GI tract, um, as far as kids go, the abdominal muscles are less developed. Um, they're less protection from trauma. Your muscles, even though, I mean, obviously, you know, your rib cage stops at the diaphragm, your abdominal wall is actually really thick. Um, it's in, it's dense muscle. It's strong enough to not just move you and do a bunch of crunches or whatever you want to do with it. Um, but it's also thick enough to actually act as a as a barrier from the outside world. Um, no, it's not as strong as your rib cage, but for design of movement, we don't want bones there anyway. But the liver, spleen, and kidneys are proportionally larger, and they're situated more anteriorly, which means more toward the front of the stomach. So if the if a child gets hit there, um, I mean we talked about how bad those things will bleed. They're much more prone to having a lot of bleeding in that area. So if a child takes a bad hit to the stomach area, um, if they're too small for their seat belt, that's one of the things, the reason why we want kids in booster seats or um, child seats and that kind of thing is because if they're too small, the bottom of the seat belt rides up too high. And anatomically, if they get into an accident, the seat belt's not supposed to kill you, but it could it could do that if you're a child wearing, a you know, this not in the booster seat or something that keeps that bottom strap lower on their on their abdomen. Um, so just keep that in mind. You know, with those organs being closer to the front, injuries of that sort are going to cause a lot more issues, and it could be fatal. It's not if you see a bruising there, that's a that's a pro, that's a much bigger problem for a child than it is for an adult. All right, the musculoskeletal system. Sometimes I feel like you could have a chapter on this on its own but we don't really talk too much about it here. Open growth plates allow bones to grow during childhood. For long bones, there's two areas, one at each end. It's right between the shaft of the bone and the head, and it's called the epiphyseal region. When you're a child, that's where your epiphyseal plate is, and it almost looks like a piece of cartilage inside the bone. And as you grow, you know, you know your legs are going to get longer, you, whatever, you're growing taller. That's where you grow from. As long as that plate isn't ruptured, it will continue to grow bone from it until it runs out and then seals up. And even an adult bone, if you were to take a cross section of an adult bone and look, you would see what we call spongy bone, which is where you can you can see all the little holes and it looks like a sponge. But where that epiphyseal plate was, it's just solid all the way across. So you can always see where a person's growth plate was on each long bone, um, no matter how old they are. But in children, if you if they break a bone, that's not, I mean, it's bad. You can get a cast, or whatever. Kids break bones all the time. Where it becomes a real big problem is if they break it at the head and they pop that plate. If they break the epiphyseal plate, that plate will no longer create bone. And so the, the bone won't grow properly. It might be fine on the other end. That, that side will grow longer, but they're not going to get the full length that they're supposed to get. So one leg will be shorter than the other. One arm will be shorter than the other. Um, if they only break one of their forearm bones, like for example, they break their ulna, but not their radius. That could be a major problem because as they continue to grow, the radius is gonna grow faster than the ulna, which can start to displace and push their wrists around, their hands are gonna start to, to warp out and all that stuff. And so this is long-term medical, surgical, possibly re-breaking bones, all that stuff, just in a controlled environment as they grow. Um, 
like I said, they, that's why they have docs that go to school for almost 20 years to be orthopedic surgeons, is to deal with stuff like this. Um, anyway, if there is a bone length discrepancy, if one leg is shorter than the other or something, it's probably because they took an injury to that growth plate. It's important to immobilize extremities with sprains and strains because those can actually cause stress fractures. And depending on where the break is, it can the secondary injury could cause damage to the plate, whereas the actual impact or whatever happened, the car wreck, that kind of thing, may not have done it on its own. The bones of an infant's head are flexible and soft. Remember to pay attention to your fontanelles. That's where the actual the lobes of the skull are they're meeting, they're meeting together, but they haven't fused yet. So there's just cartilage there. The purpose of that is so that when the child is born, their head can actually kind of collapse in to fit through the birth canal. Um, and as they get older, the fontanelles will close up. But we can use that as an assessment tool. It's a very, very useful one. So if a child, for example, has sunken fontanelles where you look at their skull and the little regions between the bones are sunk in, what does that tell you? What do you think that might tell you about the child? Dehydration. Good. All right. What if they're bulging out? And there's a couple things that bulging out can tell you. Pressure. Yeah. Ultimately, it's pressure. That's what it boils down to. But what what might, like, try to be a little bit more specific. Give me an example. Okay. Yeah. If they're really throwing a tantrum, um, that can cause their fontanelles to bulge. There's a certain um, sickness that I want you guys to think about that babies can get, or actually anybody can get it, but um, I've actually seen it more commonly in kids, even though I don't think it's documented as being more common. And an easy way to tell is that their fontanelles are swelling. Not really shaking syndrome. Um, there it is, meningitis. Shaking syndrome can do it, yes, because you're going to cause issues where they start to get basically a TBI from shaking syndrome, um, or well, from the shaking, and that's what shaking syndrome is. But um, meningitis, eh, you, know, you spelled it pretty close. Um, meningitis is big because as the brain starts, to, as the meninges starts to swell, it's going to push up on the fontanelles. So if a child is you know, not able to talk, but they're they're crying in this shrieking, painful cry. Um, they're not moving like they should, or even if they can. I mean, if it's an infant, they don't have a lot of head movement anyway. But if it's some, if it's in an age where this child should be able to turn their head pretty easily and they can't do it, and they're crying or they hurt really, really bad, and their fontanelles are bulging. They probably have meningitis. Like that's a pretty you can't diagnose that in the field, but it's a pretty good assumption. And it's a pretty it's a decent enough prognosis to work with to say, you know what? Uh we're gonna go to the hospital. Come on, that kind of thing. So that's just something I want to point out. Sunken fontanelles always keep an eye on for because that means dehydration, but look for the swollen ones too. Fontanelles shouldn't necessarily be prominent either way. They should be pretty well even with the with the bones, they should just be noticeable when you look for them is a good way to put it. If you look at a kid's head and you see what looks like, you know, welding beads running around, uh, running the length of his head, that's swollen fontanelles, bulging fontanelles. If you look at his head and it's just sunk in, it looks like stuff like you've got ditches dug across his skull that's uh, sunken. So keep that in mind. And then as then fontanelles are going to be there for a few years. So you can use that through toddlers or whatever. It takes a few years for the fontanelles to really close up all the way. They get smaller in the first couple of years, but they don't, I think it's like four or five by the time the fontanelles start to really seal up and be gone. All right, anyway, um, we've heard, already talked about that, talked about bulging and sunken. The thoracic cage in children is highly elastic and pliable because it's primarily composed of cartilaginous connective tissue. So they don't have solid bone ribs yet. All right. They have cartilage. And that's a good thing because if you ever have to do CPR on a child, you can get much better compressions because you're not having to deal with bones that might break. All right. You're not 
if you hear popping in a child, that's you're not breaking his bones. You can relax on that. What you're doing is is you're pushing air around, air that may have gotten into the joints. Um, that's not bad. All right, and even if it was, it's better to have a couple broken bones than it is to be dead. So the integumentary system, which is your skin, um, there is a couple of differences. The skin's a little thinner. There's less fat. Um, it is it's very smooth, you know, yes, but it's not really going to do a whole lot of protection. Um, they don't have a lot of hair, very little hair on their arms, and legs, that kind of thing. Um, if they're prepubescent, they won't have any hair on their trunk, like their chest and in the genital area and stuff like that. So uh, they're more susceptible to hypothermia. The whole reason we have hair on our arms and legs is to try to stay warm. And if you don't have it, then you don't have that mechanism to stay warm. So um, infants and children, they do rely more on what they're wearing, um, you know, blankets, just warmer ambient temperature in general. A lot of that plays more into effect. Infants don't shiver. They, they, they have a different heat production. I forget what it's called, but um, they just, babies don't shiver. Like when they when they get cold, if an adult gets cold or a child gets cold, we'll start to shiver. Our teeth will chatter. What we're doing, that's our muscles trying to warm us up, right? They're causing friction. Um, they're producing heat that way. But infants don't have it. They don't shiver. They just, it's like some kind of thermogenesis. I forget what it's called. But anyway, um, that's something to keep in mind. If you're looking at a child as an assessment and you don't see them shivering, if it's a kid, oh, I'm sorry, if it's a, an infant, that's to be expected. Uh, if it's a five-year-old not shivering, well, by then they've developed it. So they should be shivering if they're at that, that range of hypothermia. So just something to keep in mind. All right. For your assessment, uh, we're actually going to kind of go through this one pretty quick because you guys should by now be able to recite to me your assessment. Your trauma assessment through all the chapters we've been through has not changed. Your medical assessment hasn't changed. That is a set in stone thing that you can and should memorize. If you don't have it yet, have it by basic or about not basic, Jesus, uh, have it by boot camp. Um, I want you to know that assessment and walk in the door. And if I say, hey, I just did this for this patient, what's your next step? And you should be able to tell me, well, I'm going to start vital signs then. Or, OK, that was a breathing thing. So I'm going to move on to circulation. That sort of thing. That's where I need you guys to be, because that's where the registry expects you to be. You're going to get questions to say you arrive on scene to this, this and this. Another EMT has just done this to his patient. What's your next step? And they're going to give you four options and all four of those options are going to be on the assessment. But um, only one of them would be the next step. You mean just like the scene size? up? Yes, all that's the same. Um, your trauma assessment, as far as like scene size up, primary, secondary and ongoing. It's all the same. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quick because I'm only going to point out the things that are different. I'm not going to try to read you guys every step of your assessment all over again. That It hasn't changed. It is no, it's not a pediatric assessment. It's just here's some differences in what you're going to be looking for. I just wanted to make sure. Was, yep. Yep. No problem. Um, yeah. The the I want you guys to have memorized. The, uh, the trauma assessment and the medical assessment when we get to boot camp. Like I said, if you don't have it yet, you still got time, but that will save you a lot of heartache. It'll save you a lot of effort when we get to the hands-on portion. There is no bone test. Um, there's, there's not an anatomy class in this. We just had that anatomy chapter. The biggest thing I want you to know as far as bones and stuff is just know your femurs and your leg, you know, that kind of thing. We're going to have to know all that. No, 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 no. That would be an anatomy class. Um, but if I told you that your femur was broken, I'd like you to know where that's at. You know, so basic anatomy, yeah, but there's not going to be a test on it. All right, so anyway, your scene, your scene size up plays out the same. Um, scene safety plays out the same. The big thing, keep in mind, your child, your patient as a child. <laughs> no, nah, man, I'm not. Mm -mm. I'm not the greatest at anatomy either. I, I'm, I'm very good at EMT level anatomy, but 
as I found out this semester in college, real anatomy kicked my ass. I don't care if that's in the recording or not. I got through it, but wow, there's a lot that I've forgotten that just we don't need to know it at this level. But um, your scene safety, your, your patient's not going to be your threat. Nine times out of 10, unless you're dealing with, say, like an adolescent, um, the child's not going to try to hurt you. The parents may try to hurt you. So your scene safety is going to be environmental. Your scene safety, as far as personal threats, you're going to be worried, especially if you're going into a home that may be an abusive situation. Um, keep your head on a swivel. You start doing the assessment on your child, you start seeing bruises. I want you to just as quickly as you realize there's a bruise there, I want you to immediately get that spidey sense going around the room because parents sees you, you know, abusive parents sees you finding all these signs of abuse. Um, it because it does become a little bit more unstable of a situation. I'm not saying they're going to jump you, but they they might. I mean, you never know. They may be like, oh crap, now I'm going to get the law involved, and I don't want that. Let me do something about this. If they're crazy enough to abuse their kid, they're probably they're probably not above abusing you either. Um, remember that children not old enough to talk will communicate the only way they know how, and that's by crying. So different cries mean different things. It's not expected that you're going to know what that is. So a lot of times there's a couple of things that are obvious. If it sounds like they're screaming in pain, that's not crying. That is they're screaming in pain. If it sounds like they're falling asleep at the same time that they're crying, that's not normal. That's a sign that they're losing consciousness. All right, that kind of thing. But if they're just crying and they're not, they're inconsolable or, you know, that kind of thing, then that's something you might look to the parent and be like, is that cry normal? That sort of thing. Because they may just be hungry at the time that you show up. It may not be, um, it may not be part of the problem. It, it may just be that they got hurt and it's feeding time and they're not getting fed because the parents are too busy trying to make sure that whatever injury happened, um, isn't a big issue. Now for your primary assessment, this is where some things change. All right. For adults, we always did the whole ABC thing and we, you're still going to think ABC on a child, but, um, we have, we, we changed the primary to be more of an across the room thing where you, you don't even have to touch the child to do anything for your primary assessment. It's great. You, you look at it from across the room and do your entire primary, um, the pediatric assessment triangle, is what we use. So this is what you can see. It's appearance, work of breathing, and circulation to the skin. So the appearance is you think about your general impression. That's your appearance. So they do they look like they're alert to the to whatever their their age range would be alert? Um, are they falling asleep on you when they're they're trying to cry, but they're they're it's almost a whimper and they're falling asleep. That's not a good appearance. Um how are they reacting? Remember, cries should have some strength to them. Not necessarily shrieks. That's usually a sign of pain, but um, it should be a pretty good forceful cry. That's what you're, you're looking at there. The work of breathing, you want to look for accessory muscle use, which is where like you see their neck kind of clenching in. That's a sign that they're struggling to breathe. They're using muscles that don't normally need to be used. Um, Children are belly breathers, which means you're going to see the belly moving. That's fine. But what we don't want to see is what we call seesaw breathing, where they're sucking in so hard or they're, they're, they're yeah, they're sucking in so hard to try to take in a breath. And because they use their diaphragm, the belly's going to rise. But if they're having to put effort into it, that's actually going to pull the chest down at the same time. So you get this seesaw effect where the stomach rises and the chest falls and then the stomach goes down and the chest comes back up. That's not what that's that's the extreme. That's not what we want to see. We just want to see some stomach rise and fall. It should look effortless. It should look like they don't have to try at all. If it looks like they're getting a workout, an ab workout, trying to do a breath, that's a problem on the work of breathing. And then circulation to the skin. Again, you know, we're not really so concerned about cap refill. I don't expect you to get a pulse at this point. Um, I just just look at the skin. If they have a breathing or I'm sorry, a bleeding problem or any kind of circulation issue, the first thing to go is going to be that skin tone. They're going to lose that pink color. They may start to turn blue. More likely they're going to turn kind of this white ashy color. Um, if you see anything other than nice pink skin, that's a problem in your primary. And that that is your primary. That's it. You're done. That's the only thing I do. 
takes less than 30 seconds, as it says on the slide. Um, a lot of times, and when you get good at this, um, it really does go very, very quickly. Like you'll you'll look at your page and be like, all right, cool, primary is done. So we talked about that for appearance. Um, we already talked about that. You're gonna get your avpu here. Uh, again, you can get it from across the room. It's modified a little bit because verbal and painful um, get m kind of muddied a little bit when you're dealing with babies, for example. So just look and see if the child, if the child would normally react to somebody being in the room and they're not, you know, you walk in the room and the child just, it's almost like they are unaware of your existence. That's usually a problem because if the child is old enough to see the other side of the room, which is like six months of age, um, they're going to at least try to turn their head toward you to see if you're there to help or hurt. Um, that's a sign, right? If if you walk in and they're just staring off into space and they don't blink at you, they're not, they don't turn their head toward you, none of that stuff, that's that's a, a problem in your appearance. Um, you can use a tickles mnemonic if it helps. So tone, interactiveness, consolability, look or gaze, and speech or cry. That's your tickles. Basically, a lot of that is basically you just look at them and see, do they look like they're still alive? Tone would be muscle tone. Are their arms, do they have any kind of positioning or are they just flopped out on the ground? Interactiveness, do they recognize that you're in the room? Do they look at you when you talk to them if they're old enough, if it's just a baby? Um, they should still kind of turn their head toward you if they're able, that kind of thing, or maybe cry more, cry less. So you should see some kind of change. Controllability, if they're crying their eyes out and there is nothing stopping them, you know, mom and dad can't calm them down. You can't calm them down. They're just crying, 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 crying. That's something wrong. And then look or gaze or speech or cry just kind of that's kind of self-explanatory in the sense that if you walk up and you you sit down beside them, it's natural for them to look toward you. Um, if they don't, then that's basically them not acknowledging you in the room. We talked about work of breathing about accessory muscle use, that sort of thing. So we're going to skip that one. That one's pretty easy. Circulation to the skin, we also talked about. Remember, um, if it's, if they're modeling, which is where they get this, this they get kind of pale, but they can, you can see the little blotches of red here and there as it starts to go away. You're, the good thing about mo uh, modeling is that that is, you're early, right? All the blood hasn't left the skin yet. It's just in the process. So if you see modeling, fantastic. You're ahead of the curve. If you can figure out what's going on and stop it from getting worse at that point, your child has a much better chance of success in getting better. If they're already just straight up cool and clammy, head to toe, no sign of pink anywhere, no sign of red, none of that, you're a little bit further behind the curve. Doesn't mean you can't do anything, but um, it's just it's just that much harder. Remember, cyanosis is a late sign of respiratory failure or shock, and it starts in the extremities. If you see cyanosis in their trunk, they've been down for a long, long time. So from the PAT findings, you'll decide if the patient is stable or not. Um, if you do your assessment triangle and everything looks fine, then yeah, you can consider them stable. If you see something wrong, if something stands out to you from those three areas, then they're unstable. And again, um, because this is designed to be done very fast and from across the room, it stands to reason that what you're looking for are going to be things that should really be easily noticeable, right? So if you're looking at them and you're like, they look fine, but I can't quite tell if that's a problem, it's probably not a problem. We're talking about the things that you walk in and they look like they are dying on the floor or they're just, you know, comatose or something like that. That's the kind of stuff that you're looking at in your primary because you're only, just like your ABCs, you're only worried about life threats. So don't let a little discoloration mess with you. Don't let, um, uh, it looks like he's breathing a little slow or a little fast or whatever. If he's breathing, he's breathing. That's what matters here. The patient's unstable. You can do the regular ABCs, um, treat for any life threats and transport immediately. So basically you're gonna jump into your normal assessment. 
with obvious life-threatening external hemorrhage, treat that first. Um, it really doesn't make sense to try to push oxygen into lungs if there's no blood to move it around the body. If they're completely unconscious, if you show up, let's say they're, um, you walk in, they're completely unconscious. That's all right. Well, my assessment of PAT, I, <laughs> you know, appearance looks like absolute horse manure. Um, I curse too much. <laughs> um, you show you the first thing you want to do if you find somebody unresponsive, completely unresponsive is what? Think very basic CPR. If somebody's unresponsive, the first thing we're going to check is good, a pulse. That's right. If they're if they're completely unresponsive, we've already tried to get their app. We now know they're unresponsive. So the next step is a pulse. If they don't have one, nothing else matters. We are going into CPR. So CAB right? Compressions, airway, breathing. If um, if you check them and they do have a pulse, then you're not going the CPR route with CAB. You're still in your assessment. So you're going to do ABC. You're going to make sure they have an airway, breathe for them. Because if they aren't breathing, then they will lose the pulse. And we don't want that to happen. If you get there and they still have a pulse, then fantastic. Let's not make it any worse. Um, if they're stable, then just continue, like I said, continue with your assessment. Next thing you're going to do, you're going to perform a hands-on ABC assessment. So this is your assessment, just like you would do at any other time. Your airway, you're going to open the airway, put in your, your patent airways if you need to. Um, be your OPA or your NPA. They do make infant-sized OPAs and NPAs if they'll take it. Use the head tilt chin lift if it's medical. Use the jaw thrust if it's trauma. And just remember, for your head tilt chin lift, you're not um, you're not going all the way back, right? We're gonna put their head to a neutral position, kind of like a sniffing position, and then that's far enough. Um, for your breathing, look, listen, and feel. So just like an adult, kind of put your ear down close to their face. You're looking for that belly rise because it's children, not adults. Looking for the belly rise. You're listening for airflow or like, like any air movement and you're feeling to see if you feel them breathing out on the side of your face or on the side of your ear. Um, for infants, because their lungs are so much smaller, you're going to have to get a little bit closer to their face when you're doing that. Don't, don't just rip, don't lose them. As a, they're not a pillow, but you want to be pretty close. Um, adults, we move more air. Obviously, you don't have to be a millimeter from the nose, but children just keep in mind they're not gonna their natural exhale is not gonna push a whole bunch of air out so if you you see belly rise but you don't feel anything that's still that's still a breath that's fine you just want to see that belly movement and that's usually good um because vital signs are so much higher in infants and kids if they are there but they're very low just get you know bag them like it says there, bradypnea is a ominous sign. Just because they're breathing, if it's if it's lower than what an adult would do, then it's just not enough. All right. They can still be taking breaths and it not be enough to sustain. They can still have a heartbeat and it just not be enough to sustain. Um, know your vitals. Like I said, what I always went with was 15 to 30 for kids, 25 to 50 for for infants for breathing. If they were more than five shy of that from that minimum i was bagging them so if they had if it was a kid breathing 10 times a minute i bagged them if it was an infant breathing 20 times a minute i bagged them um you won't go wrong with that even if i dare say if an evaluator gives you they want you to think that it's normal breathing but they give you something that gets you into that that pucker factor range and you decide to bag them they're not going to fault you for that if the and the evaluators should know that if they want you to um, to find something out of the range, they're going to give you something that is clearly out of the range. So, you know what? Actually, I'm going to I'm going to say this too. Um, I know it's kind of getting off the topic, but this will help you on the registry. 
something I've seen because this is this is what most people fail. Um, the biggest thing about pediatric patients is realizing that that's what you're looking at. If you're looking, if you're on in the real world and you walk into a room and it's a two year old, you know it's a two year old, or you at least know it's a toddler, you know that kind of thing. But if you're staring at words on a screen, as the uh, registry is. And it says you show up to a residence with a 12 year old, blah, blah, blah. It's not going to say child. It's just going to say a 12 year old male or age, whatever. And you start reading off on things and you see these vital signs and these vital signs because you're in adult mode. You've gone through 30 questions with adults. And then you get this one that just says 12 year old male or something like that. And it gives you vital signs. And those vital signs are going to look like they're all through the roof if you're in adult mode. And so that's going to be what. Don't let that be what the, the question shoots you down, right? Because if you miss the age, you may start to think that the vitals are out of whack for your patient when really the vitals were, were good. Um, or you miss the age and you get adult vitals, but as a child, you may think, well, the vitals look good. They're within normal limits. He's breathing 16 times a minute. He's got a pulse of 60. Fantastic. But as a three-year-old. Which means that you should you should be doing CPR. Um, pay very close attention to the things that you wouldn't think you'd be paying attention to. Most of the time, when you look at numbers on the question in the registry, you're looking at vital signs. Make sure you don't miss the age because it changes the vital signs, but it doesn't change the vital signs. It changes what would be normal for the vital signs. If you can catch that, pretty sure you will pass pediatric. Pediatric, most of the time when people miss pediatric questions because they don't realize that they're taking a pediatric question. They just miss the age. Um, take your time. Read the questions fully. Make sure you understand everything. Not everything is needed for the answer, but um, you still want to make sure you don't just miss a part of the question. I've, I've seen that happen a lot, and um, I just wanted to put that out there. All right, anyway, moving forward. Circulation. So you must determine if the patient has a pulse, right? But again, if you're talking about a child, specifically a non-teenager child, like we're like six years old, 10 years old, whatever, um, remember that their pulse range is higher. If they have 60, if they're a baby and they got a pulse of 60, or even a, a six-year-old with a pulse of 60, that's, that's chest compression range. Uh, infants and children can tolerate only a small amount of blood loss. So it's not like not like adults where we can lose two and a half, three liters of blood before we die from it. Kids lose much less. In infants, we look on their brachial pulse or their femoral pulse. Don't go for the wrist. You're probably not going to find it. Don't go for the neck because if you cut it off, um, you cause some major issues with them for their cerebral perfusion. So go for the brachial inside of the inside of the upper arm. If you can't find one there. Or if for whatever reason you need to find a um, an inferior pulse, then go for the femoral. In children older than a year, you can palpate for the carotid. Strong central pulses usually indicate that the child is not hypotensive. If they can, if you can feel it, they should have good blood pressure. Um, remember, blood pressure is your your um, exception to the rule as far as vitals go. I, mean, I told you that the smaller the person, the higher the numbers. When it comes to blood pressure, it's the it's the opposite. Your blood pressure is going to climb with the person's size. When they're born, blood pressure is very, very low. They just, they just don't need that much pressure. As they get older, as they get bigger, the blood pressure is the systolic is going to climb up with their height. Um, the numbers that are high at the beginning are mostly your breathing and your pulse. So a trend of an increasing or decreasing pulse rate may suggest worsening hypoxia or shock or improvement after treatment. If it's getting higher, that's a good thing. Um, unless it's already high and it's getting even higher than that. that. That's when it's a problem. When hypoxia or shock become critical, then everything starts to crash. Um, bradycardia occurs. Remember, like I said, and I'll beat this to death because I see this missed also. Just because they have a pulse does not mean that they're out in, in the clear. If they get a pulse around 
60 to 80 or definitely less than 60, it's still CPR. Fill the skin for temperature and moisture and estimate the cap refill time. Just remember that your cap refill time is more of a trend than it is a, uh, a set in stone rule. When you're dealing with kids, it's not just ABCs, it's ABCDE. Um, and if you go on to, they're actually trying to make DE be part of the primary for everything. I know that paramedics have been learning D and E for a while now, but for whatever reason, EMTs just only got taught ABC. Anyway, disability um, has to do with their neuros. So your APU, your GCS, your pupil response, all that stuff is going to be in disability. You're looking for things to make sure that the brain is working like it should be. So check their pupils, um, check their reflexes. If it's a kid, you can flick the bottom of their feet. You can check for pain. Um, if they don't feel pain when they should, like if you pinch them and nothing happens, that's a problem. That's what you're looking at for D. For E, it's exposure. Um, this is basically just exposing the skin, making or exposing the body, and making sure you can do your assessment. So when you do this, make sure that you still keep your patient warm. You're taking away their clothing. You're taking away a layer of feet uh, from them. So cover them up, bring them to the ambulance where you can turn the heater on, that kind of thing. Make your transport decision, sick or not sick. And if you're like the rest of us, if it's a child, it doesn't matter. They're going to be high priority for transport because we're all going to be freaking out. Uh, if they're less than 40 pounds. All right. So. Oh, sorry. Um, transporting children in an ambulance is really it doesn't it doesn't alleviate you from any of the same laws. than if the parents were to transport the child in their own vehicle, if they are under 40 pounds, they need to be in a car seat or at least a booster. Um, they do make these really cool instead you can you first of all you can use a child's normal car seat all right but do you really want to do that if you're taking them from a car wreck for example because the seat the seat might have gotten broken right um if your ambulance company doesn't already have it it may be good for them to purchase they're these they roll up or they unroll you can say they unroll you put them on your normal stretcher um, and you actually tighten it in with the belts that are attached to the stretcher. And then the, um, the, the, the harness itself has straps coming off of both sides. The back side goes around and clips into itself to hold the harness to the, to the stretcher. And then the other set of straps on the front side, that is to put the child in place. So you're basically anchoring the child to the stretcher using a harness that is designed for a child as opposed to those three straps that are five feet apart from each other and meant for adults. All right, for history taking, um, pretty much all the same. There's a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, sometimes parents won't know if the child has allergies, especially if it's an infant infant. There's not a lot of, um, experiences to tell whether or not there's allergies right they haven't come in contact with certain meds they haven't come in contact with certain foods you really don't know they've never been stung we don't know if they're if they have a, a bee sting allergy or anything like that um opqrst depending on how old your patient is you can go ahead and toss it out the window because if they're if they can't talk to you they're not going to understand or they're not going to be able to tell you what hurts if they can talk, but they don't understand the questions you're asking, they don't have that ability to think on that level, it ain't going to matter. You, you can't get OPQRST from the parents. You can only get it from the person experiencing the pain. But that being said, technically pediatrics goes all the way to 8 to 17. So if you're dealing with an adolescent, then yes, by all means, ask OPQRST. Um, sample and OPQRST are the same. There's no changes between the two. So if you're going to ask them, just ask them like you ever would to any adult. Your physical exams. Remember what we talked about in the um, beginning of the chapter with lifespan and development? 
So dignity becomes a real big thing pretty quick. Um, and then keep mom or dad there. That's actually a good rule of thumb, especially if you're having to do a head to toe assessment, just because they can, they can be there to know what's happening and, and they can rest assured that nothing untoward ever, never happened or anything like that. Cause even though you may not do anything, um, as you can see, the background checks aren't that strict for getting into EMS. And some people, I hate to say it, that's the world we live in, but some people will do things that they're not supposed to do. So um, having the parents there will help alleviate that worry. So they can't really say that anything happened because they were sitting right there. It's not like anything's going to happen in front of them. Use your DCAT BTLS mnemonic just like you would for an adult. If it's a four to six year old, three to six year old kid, start at the feet, work your way up. Unless you, unless it's like a head injury, obviously then go to the head. But if you, as far as the, the full body scan goes, start at the feet, work backwards. Let's see, we already talked about that. And then this part right here, infants, toddlers, and preschool age kids start at the feet and work your way to the head. Uh, once they reach school age and they get a little bit older, you can you can actually start working from head to toe. That's fine. The closer they get to adult, the more of a normal assessment you can do. When we're looking for your head to toe at each individual thing, um, remember DCAP BTLS for everything, right? But look for bruising, swelling, and hematomas, and assess the fontanelles in infants. That's the big thing that's going to be different for kids is that they have the fontanelles. So if I give you a scenario, um, and like I said, I'm not going to give you all curveballs. I'm just going to make sure that you understand when you have to shift gears for things and what needs to be added in or not. If it's a child, check the fontanelles. That's, that's just something that's there that's not in adults. When we deal with the nose, um, Children are very susceptible to congestion and mucus because their nose is much smaller than what an adult would be. That that physical space is just not as big. So it takes much less to fill it up. We have, most of the time, most ambulances carry a pediatrics kit. It's a separate bag than the normal med bag. Um, it's, it's smaller. It really doesn't have to be as big. It's usually, it's bright colored. So it looks almost like a toy. That way it, it's not threatening to the kid. Um, and we just keep all of our pediatric stuff in there. So the pediatric OPAs and NPAs are there. We have smaller bandages, so like two by twos instead of four by fours. Um, instead of using a suction, suction, we have the bulb catheter, the bulb syringe, that kind of thing is going to be in there. Um, because those are the things that we're going to use on a child. And that way we don't have to be digging through and moving, you know, big old pair of scissors out of the way and, God forbid they see needles in there and stuff like that that we would have in the adult kit. Um, it just makes it much better, makes it much easier on the on the patient. So something for you guys to think about when you go to your your jobs or whatever, if they don't already have it, especially you firefighters. Um, sometimes it's nice to just make a separate bag for peds. And then, like I said, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, just something that is less threatening. Because you walk in there with this huge ass bag. And you pop it down in front of them, the bag is bigger than the kid is. That sometimes is pretty intimidating. All right, for the ears, nothing's really different. If you're looking for the drainage from the ears, drainage around the, you know, you get the battle signs, that kind of thing. Around the mouth, it's the same thing. Look for any broken teeth. If they have any teeth to begin with, they may not. Um, and then note the smell of the breath when we're dealing with teenagers because they're much more susceptible to doing things like drinking um, or other other recreational activities and stuff that they may not want to admit to. See if you can smell it on their breath, but just, you know, don't, don't do like the cops used to do. Like I said, they've gotten better. Don't be like, oh, I smell it on your breath. You must be drunk, right? Still do your due diligence, but um, don't rule it out. For the neck, we have three things that we check for, and it's not going to change no matter how old they are. You're looking for tracheal deviation in the front, JVD on the sides, and cervical spine step off in the back. All right, so front, both sides, and back get checked. The chest is going to be the same. Uh, just remember that their ribs aren't completely formed yet, so you're not going to want to press too hard 
Um, just be aware that, did I skip? No, I did skip it. All right. Um, remember there's less space in the chest cavity and with those ribs not being fully formed yet, blunt force trauma has a better chance of doing damage than in an adult. Your back, there's really no differences to inspection on, on the back. Same with the abdomen. Um, you're going to inspect the abdomen for distension. And, geez, I'm going way too fast on the slides. I apologize. Um, gently palpate and watch for guarding. If, a, if an infant or even just a child in general has been hit in the stomach and they really are hurt, even if it's not a like a, a life-threatening hurt, if it's just bad enough that it hurt, like they're experiencing moderate or worse pain, they're not going to want you to touch. They're going to they're going to curl up. They're going to guard it with their arms. They may get into the fetal position, that sort of thing. Um, but you're still just going to check for your DCAP BTLS. And if they are complaining about it hurting in a certain spot, remember check that spot that spot last because if you poke and prod there first, that's all they're going to feel. They're not going to they're, they're going to be in so much pain from that that they won't be able to tell you if another spot hurts them. Look for seatbelt abrasions or bruising. And remember, um, especially if they're not in a car seat or, or where they need to be, they run the risk of the bottom, the lap belt portion of the seat belt being too high up. So pay attention to where you see those seat belt abrasions and bruising. You don't want them to be high. If they are, that's a huge red flag. They need to get to the hospital real quick, even though it might just be some bruising, at least as far as what your assessment is showing you. But because of where it's at and how their organs are, they're a much bigger risk. And then for your extremities, it's still the four point push pull. Look for symmetry. It's still growing. So if they did break their uh, growth plate at any point, you're going to start to have differences in length, like one leg will be shorter than the other. Um, compare both sides. They should have equal strength in both sides. If they don't, then that's a neurological issue, that kind of thing. All right. So before we move into the vital signs, um, actually, you know what? No, we'll finish the assessment portion because we're almost done with it. So we'll finish this and then we're going to take another break. But for your vital signs, the big thing to, again, like I've said, remember that vital sign ranges are higher. All right. Get it into your head so that you remember their pulse ranges, all whatever range is for adults, you, you've got it. I know you guys know it because we've been over it the entire class. Just remember what the PEDS ranges are. And even if you don't remember the exact numbers, remember they are in a kind of a gray area, so whatever. If the test or the evaluator wants you to know or wants you to think tacky, they're going to give you a number that is definitely tacky. Um, but just don't, you know, the big important thing is don't, don't start looking for adult vital ranges in a child on accident because... 60 is fine for an adult, but 60 is CPR for a kid. Um, we don't normally check a blood pressure in infants or anybody younger than three, just because the, the constriction of the cuff can do some damage to their arm, not to mention it scares the hell out of them. They don't like it, and it's going to freak out, and that's going to throw all their other vital signs out of whack, and we just don't want to do that. Your skin's your best indicator. And the cool part about that is that you did it in your primary. So as soon as they start to lose circulation, um, their skin's going to be the first thing you're going to notice. It's really hard to say that anxiety is the first step for, uh, or the first sign of hypoxia in kids because they're already going to be anxious. Adults, we don't freak out as easy. We, we, we know injuries. We may not know how to fix them. We may not be, we still need 911, but we understand that you know, we may or may not die from that injury, but a child is going to be, they don't know, they don't know the damage. They don't know if this is a punishment for something. And then now they're starting to worry about that. And so they're going to get anxious, even if they're not hypoxic. So use your skin color or your skin condition. I'm not going to make you guys know this formula. All this stuff right here is you're not going to see it. Um, just know that your systolic blood pressure is lower the younger they are. The older they get, the more it climbs up until it gets to that normal range of 120. 
All right, and then for your reassessment, it's all the same. Again, if they're stable, 15 minutes. If they're unstable every five minutes, continue to um, continue to reassess any interventions you did in your primary and your pediatric assessment triangle that you did at the beginning, that appearance, work of breathing and all that, that can be a constant thing. That's something that, because you all you have to do is look at your patient. So that's not something you're gonna repeat. That's something you're just going to do. Like it's just, it's a continuous thing. So if at any point you see your patient starting to get a weird color in their skin, that should tell you something. Even if you're only at the two minute mark for um, reassessing. It's all right, fix it then. And then make sure you communicate and document everything. Um, when it comes to kids, a lot of times these, if, if something is gonna wind up in court, it usually winds up being over either a child or an elderly person. So make sure that you put good documentation together for this, because it could get called back at any time. All right, now we're gonna take a break. We're gonna take about at least a five minute um, I'm going to try to make it closer to five than 10 this time, and we'll continue on with different emergencies.
All right, continuing on. Now this part, um, there are some things that I'm gonna, I am really gonna fly through on this because we talked about it. These are, we're gonna start going over different sicknesses and different issues that you're gonna run into with peas. But we're gonna talk about things like epiglottitis and croup and all that stuff. And if you recall, we talked about all of that in the airway, I'm sorry, in the respiratory emergencies chapter. So if I move quickly through this, it's because we've already done it and it is recorded. I don't want anybody to feel like they're being left behind or that we're blowing things off. Um, it's just that because we record things, it is easier if you need to. You can by all means, go back and watch that because that information and this information is the exact same. There's no croup is croup. All right. Um, epiglottitis is epiglottitis, that kind of thing. I will hit it. We'll skim through it. Hopefully it's a review. If I do lose you, you can ask me that. It's perfectly fine. And you can even send it in a in a private message if you want to. But I do recommend that if, if um, any of this does sound Greek, if you forgot some of it, um, again, you're not doctors. I don't expect you to be. So just basically have the, the basics of these down. Know a couple of key things like this is an upper respiratory. This is a lower respiratory. This one's mostly in kids, um, that kind of thing. If you if you've got that, you're fine. Uh, if it does, if it would benefit you, then by all means, go back and watch the second half of the um, respiratory emergencies chapter. It was one of the last things we talked about that night. So the last second half, the last third, somewhere around in there is all of these illnesses. Because we still have like 130 slides to go through. Um, but a lot of it is just repeat information. So you don't really have to touch on it. If this were a traditional class and we didn't have the recordings, then yeah. But then this would be like an all week long class as well. So respiratory problems are the leading cause of cardiopulmonary arrest in pediatric population. The leading cause of death is very rarely going to be cardiac related. Most of the time when it comes to kids, it's respiratory. That's the system that fails. And it can be from anything. It can be from a physiologic issue. It can be from an anatomical issue. It could be from those pesky Jolly Ranchers and um, hard candies that they choke on or, you know, pennies, quarters, whatever. Um, but the important thing is that you as an EMT, you, you realize this. You realize that the respiratory tract is the biggest thing. When we walk into a room, if we have to do any kind of patient positioning, um, airway is critical. That is what we're looking for. I, I, I would dare say, unless they somehow like chopped off a foot and they're hemorrhaging out, the only thing that comes before making sure their airway is set and they got good respirations is a tourniquet. Um, otherwise, yeah, airway, 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 make sure they're breathing. Um, during respiratory distress, the pediatric patient is working harder to breathe and will eventually go into respiratory failure if it's left untreated. The good thing is, is it doesn't really happen like that. Um, you know, at the snap of a finger, there is a trend to it. So, or there is a process or a progress to it, however you want to look at it. So it's not like the first time they miss an easy breath, they're going to die on you. But the sooner you recognize it, the better, because there's a lot of respiratory issues that we can't really reverse. We can just try to get ahead of it and slow it down. So the longer it happens without intervention from you, the worse it's going to be before you stop it. And then, the, like I said, the best you can do is just keep it where it's at. That means they could perpetually be in a bad position that you really can't get them back from. And that's a problem. Um, in the early stages of respiratory distress, you may note changes in the pediatric patient's behavior. So just like before, when we talked about with adults, um, they may become combative, restless, or anxious. It's hard to gauge that though sometimes because they may already be that way, even if they're not having respiratory issues. Some signs and symptoms of increased worker breathing include, include nasal flaring, which is where their nostrils flare out, normal breathing sounds. They should just be clear, nice, smooth air movement. That's what you should hear. If you hear anything like a wheeze, a whistle, um, water, some kind of fluid, anything like that, if it sounds like they're breathing underwater, those are problems. Accessory muscle use, which is going to be the muscles around the shoulders, the neck, um, the chest itself, because remember, they're belly breathers. Um, if they're up in the tripod position, those are going to be all your signs that they're having problems breathing. And a lot of this stuff you can see from across the room. So that's your pediatric assessment triangle. Remember, that's what you're looking for, for that kind of thing. 
as the patient progresses to possible respiratory failure, you're going to see their efforts to breathe decrease because they're wearing out. And their chest rise, if there is any, if they're old enough to have a chest rise, um, you're going to see it happen less and less. Their breathing is going to start to shallow out. And then with that means they're not going to get enough minute volume, enough tidal volume, and they're going to, they're going to pass out. And unfortunately, um, it winds up more often than not that the circulatory system is, think of it, it's almost impatient. Circulatory system says, respiratory system slowing down, screw it, I'm done. Like they may, not, they may not even be completely in respiratory arrest and the rest of the body is gonna stop. It is that critical to make sure that their breathing is, is as good as it can be. Um, you wanna try to keep it as close to perfect as possible because the rest of the body is just gonna be like, ah, well, hands in the air, we're done, whatever. The body has used up all its available energy stores and cannot continue to support the extra work of breathing. Without care, cyanosis may develop, and so will um, rigor mortis and other things that come with death. Changes in behavior will also occur until the pediatric patient demonstrates um, an altered level of consciousness. So again, they may start off just getting kind of combative and, and anxious and everything, and then that's going to lead to the sleepiness the uh, the drowsy, the, the, the way they're trying to cry, but they're running out of energy. So it almost looks like they're falling asleep trying to cry. That's a sign. That's your altered level of consciousness. Um, they may experience periods of apnea, which is where they do stop breathing for a little bit and then kind of start back up. And then they'll stop for a little bit and they'll start back up. As the lack of oxygen becomes even more serious, then the heart muscle starts to get hypoxic and it slows down. And remember, their heart rate has to be fast when they're kids. 60 or less, you're doing CPR. Um, but when it starts to slow down, now even if they are breathing, the blood's not getting oxygen to the tissues like it should, and so things do start to fall apart really fast. Their heart rate is their only defense mechanism for shock of any sort. So that is, again, that's critical. We had, and, But to fix that, especially as EMTs, you guys, you all can't push epi. So to get the heart rate up, you have to focus on the respiratory system. Um, if it looks like they're in a situation where they do legit need medication, that's where you would call your ALS in when you're considering your additional resources. All right, respiratory failure does not always indicate respiratory, I'm oh, sorry, airway obstruction. Sometimes it does, and we're about to talk about that. Um, but a lot of times it could be it could be anything. It could be maybe they got a scent like a uh, a certain perfume sometimes can do it that causes their bronchioles to spasm and then they can't breathe. It just locks up their airway. Um, sometimes it is traumatic. Could be nervous system problems. Dehydration will do it, which if they're dehydrated, remember, look at the fontanelles. That's a great tell as to whether or not that's an issue. Could be a metabolic disturbance if their electrolytes get out of whack, particularly their um Sodium and potassium can cause issues. A pediatric patient's condition can progress from respiratory distress to respiratory failure at any time. And when it happens, it happens fast. So that's, again, that's why like, I will, I'm not trying to repeat it, but I need to, um, because this is what's going to save kids' lives. You guys, I want this to be almost, I want y'all to be the one trick ponies in this case where you walk in you see them having a problem, just the only thing that should go in your head is this big, bright, flashing billboard that says respiratory and fix it. A child or an infant in respiratory distress needs supplemental oxygen. So you're gonna be a full-blown EMT like they always pick on you, right? You know, O2 and transport. It's pretty much what you're gonna do, but that's what saves their life. Even if as a paramedic, O2 <laughs> and transport. Um, does you know their physiology doesn't change just because a person working on them wears a different color patch. For infants and children and possible respiratory failure, assistive ventilation with a BVM at 100% oxygen. Don't worry about the 94 to 99. Just 100% oxygen. Um, allow the pediatric patient to remain in a comfortable position. It's usually going to wind up being a tripod position, or if they're small enough, um, they'll want to sit in the lap of their parents or whoever their caregiver is. Airway obstructions, as you can see from the picture, like we said earlier, you know, children will put, if they can fit it in their mouth, they will. 
Um, and so they all took on toys, coins, candies, um, whatever they can find in the cabinets that they get managed to open up. In cases of trauma, it can be teeth that they get dis they get dislodged in their airway, blood, vomit, food, um, any other secretions can cause this. The big thing that I want you to know about airway obstructions. I'm going to teach this to you in the CPR sense. If you can understand, I'm not going to be going to understand. That's the wrong way of saying it. Um, if you can truly, all right, well, we'll say it that way. If you can understand this, and I don't mean that from your capability, I just mean that if, as, if you understand what I'm saying and you can apply this to any kind of obstruction, then these 10 slides can be rounded up in two steps. First of all, if it's solid and it's a complete, airway blockage where they're not crying they're not breathing they're just there's no air movement put them in your hand turn them a little bit upside down if they're infants and then you're going to do five back slaps on the back rotate them five chest compressions with your two fingers the, just like you learned in cpr and these are not soft all right if anybody is, is close to my age or ever heard anybody my age talk about how our parents used to take care of choking kids it was they just walked up and they just slapped the shit out of you in your back until you coughed it up and it was it was literally it was like they like you owed them money or you cursed at them or something and they weren't being mean that was just they they knew what they may not have known the finesse of, of the heimlich maneuver but they knew what they were doing they were trying to knock the wind out of you to push that object out um the if it's a liquid then just sit them up right um gravity can work on that the liquid doesn't get lodged liquid just covers it, it fills up an area so if you sit them up liquid's going to go back where it belongs which is in the stomach um if it's not a complete block then you can let them try to cough it up they should probably still go to the hospital to get whatever it is removed but you don't have to do a Heimlich maneuver or anything of that sort on somebody with only a partial airway obstruction. Some airway obstructions aren't even really airway obstructions. They're like the croup, for example, or epiglottitis. Um, they don't obstruct the airway, but what they do is because they're swollen, they kind of restrict things down. So your child can still breathe, but um, they just may not be able to breathe very well. If it's an older child, you're going to be doing airway obstructions just like you would do for an adult, which means that, um, you know, you get behind them, put your one fist underneath their diaphragm, other hand is there for support, and you're doing abdominal thrusts. But again, these are not soft. These are not gentle. These are violent thrusts. You're basically punching them um, in a controlled manner to knock the wind out of them. There's no, there's no pace to this. There's no rate. It's just hit it, reset, hit it again, reset, hit it again until they hopefully cough it up. If they don't cough it up and they go unconscious and we fall into CPR mode, you just do CPR. When you get to airway, you look to see if you can see what they were choking on. And if you can, you swipe it out. If not, ignore it, continue CPR. Next time you get to airway, you look and see if those compressions moved it. If you can see it, swipe it and you just keep repeating the process. All right, for asthma, a this is a condition in which the smaller airway um, bronchioles become inflamed. They'll swell up. They can produce excess mucus, and it can lead to difficulty breathing. It hurts to breathe. Anybody in here with asthma? If you want to say, I mean, that's a medical thing. You don't have to admit it by any means, but um, I don't have asthma. So... You guys, some of this stuff, y'all may be able to say better than I could if you either grew up with it or if you still have it. Um, this is a true emergency. If it's not promptly identified and treated, a lot of people live with asthma and they just take inhalers for it. So if you show up to a scene and that's what they've got, chances are they've got an inhaler. Uh, when it comes to kids, kids may not be the most, uh, so they're not the most skilled with it. So a lot of times they'll come with a spacer. Now, normally when we use an inhaler, you have your, you instruct your patient to breathe it in and hold their breath for 10 seconds. Um, and they're, they're breathing in as they release the, the albuterol from their inhaler. 
when it comes to children, especially if they're using a spacer. The spacer, all it is, is a chamber. This looks like an extension tube. So they're going to put the inhaler on one end. They're going to put their mouth on the other end. What they need to do is just go ahead and release the um, the albuterol into the spacer. They don't have to breathe in yet. Just squeeze it, get it in the spacer. Then have the child, when they're ready, hopefully sooner rather than later, take a deep, long breath out of that spacer to pull that albuterol into their into their throat and then hold it for 10 seconds before they breathe out. It's the same thing, but what they're not having to do is they're not having to try to take their breath with the force of that aerosolized albuterol being pushed into their mouth. Um, something to keep in mind, sometimes asthma or allergic reactions will completely shut a kid's airway off. And that's huge, right? If they, if, if they have no airway, they're not going to be able to breathe in that albuterol. It may wind up being that they can't, um, you may, that may be what you see. You need to um, be very aggressive with this because if that's where they're at, the albuterol can't get into their airway. They can't help them. They can't breathe. There's no air going through. And it's not like they're choking on a peppermint. You can't Heimlich maneuver your way out of an asthma attack at that level. So if that's what you're there, if you get there and that's what you see is, is extreme asthma where they just there's no airway. Um, take an EpiPen, a pediatric EpiPen, and pop them with it. Check with your, make sure you're, um, when you go to the field with that, make sure your med control is okay with it because they may tell you otherwise. But Epi will open their airway up long enough for you to get the albuterol in there. Um, that's considered an off-label use. It's legal. If it ever wound up in court, you would win that battle. But um, I have to say that with the caveat that that is not what it is designed for. So be a, be adult with it. Um, you show up to an asthma patient and they don't need it. You just all you need is to give them um, at, uh, their albuterol. They just give them their albuterol. But if you get there and they are completely shut off, it's either hit them with the epi or watch them die because you're not going to get the albuterol in. So, and even if a, if a paramedic was there, it would be epi that he gave him. He gave him. And you, epi is something that you can give as an EMT through the auto injector. So why not? I will go and sit in the courtroom and defend you over that one if it ever came to it. All right, uh, signs and symptoms for asthma. You're gonna have wheezing as the patient exhales because the air can get in, but when the, because the, the block is closer to the lungs than to the nose, um, air escaping the lungs is gonna be slower and more forceful at that point. So you're gonna hear the wheezing sound as the air tries to escape. In some cases, um, like I said, the airway is completely blocked and you won't hear any air movement. If that's the case, epi is going to be what you need to get their airway open just a little bit. The problem with epi is it's only good for two minutes or so. So it, don't let that be your solution. That is, to, that is to get the albuterol in. All right, your treatment for the asthma is not the epi. Your treatment for asthma is the albuterol treatment. Epi just may be needed to get that treatment in them. Tripod position allows for easier breathing. All right. So here's where we're talking about the uh, bronchodilator from the meter dose inhaler, which is albuterol. Um, you can use a spacer. It's much easier for kids if you do that. If you're assisting in ventilations, use slow, gentle breaths. Try not to squeeze the bag real hard. Um, I always teach people to treat your BVM like it's their actual lung. We don't breathe by gasping air in. We breathe in over the span of about a second. We allow a couple of seconds for that air to get out. If they're having an asthma attack, it's going to take a little bit longer for them to actually exhale because that air is having to push past the constricted airway. So give them a breath. It takes about a second to squeeze half the bag and then give them four or five seconds before you give them their next breath. <laughs> so. Um, let me make sure I'm on the right spot here. Here we go. All right. 
A prolonged, unrelated asthma attack may progress into status asthmaticus. That's where they just, they're just they stuck in that state. They can't really get out of it. This is a true emergency. Give them oxygen and provide rapid transport to the ER. If the, if the patient becomes so exhausted, he or she starts, stops struggling to breathe, like they've just lost the fight, um, they're probably going to go into respiratory arrest on you. Manage the airway aggressively, administer oxygen, and transport promptly. ALS support should be considered. ALS support should have been considered long before that point. <laughs> um, but yeah, if they're to the point of passing out, then call the call the paramedics if you haven't already. All right, pneumonia. Pneumonia is actually pretty common, and it's the leading cause of death for over two million children, according to the World Health Organization. Pneumonia is a general term. I call it an umbrella term. It refers to infection in the lungs. It could be any infection. We don't know. It could be C. diff, you know, whatever. Um, often a secondary infection. It will usually occur because they had started off with like a sore throat, sinus infection, that kind of thing, and it just descended down. Uh, this can also occur from a chemical injection. Children with, DC, children with diseases causing immunodeficiency, so HIV, that kind of thing, they're at an increased risk for developing pneumonia. In, incidence is greater during fall and winter months because we typically don't get out and do anything like exercise. We don't, um, we start breathing in recirculated air coming through heaters. We get sick more in those months and we don't want to get out and do anything. We don't go to the doctor like we should, that sort of thing. Um, in pediatric patients, you're going to see usually an unusually high rapid breathing, uh, or the breathing will be accompanied with grunting and wheezing sounds. You'll start to see those signs that they're struggling to breathe, like nasal flaring, uh, tachypnea, hypothermia, or fever. Because of their, their temperature could go either high or low, just depending. If they're in a fever, a lot of times that will tell you that they are actively fighting an infection. A unilateral diminished breath sound. So if you're listening to all four lung quadrants, um, yeah, some people still die from HIV. There's medicines to kind of stop the progression, but not everybody's got health insurance. Not everybody can afford it. Um, and a lot of poverty-stricken areas sometimes have prevalence of HIV. So unfortunately, yes, that is still a killer. People still die from the flu. I mean, it's, you know, the risk is there. Even even though medicine is available, it doesn't mean that everybody has access to it. Anyway, um, when you're checking your breath sounds for pneumonia, a lot of times you can tell where the pneumonia is at because you're going to hear breath sounds that are clear all over the place. And then there's just that one spot, usually around on the side, kind of low. Um, that's, that's usually where the least amount of air movement happens in the lungs. That's where something like pneumonia will fester and it'll grow. And with that, that area of the lung can't function properly. So you're not going to hear good airflow there. <sighs> For treatment, um, you're mostly doing supportive care. So it's going to be monitoring vitals, giving them oxygen to help get good airflow with what does work in the lungs, get them to the hospital. If the child is wheezing, you can administer a bronchodilator if permitted in your EMS system. So just like how I was talking about, you know, full-blown um, airway obstruction from asthma, check with your med director. They may allow you to use epi in those cases. Look at your protocols. Um, if not, well, don't do it. But most places, most MDs will allow it because you're just, it's an auto-injector. It's the same as if you were going to be treating for a... Um, allergic reaction. Croup, we already talked about um, in the pre in the past, like I said, this is one that's mostly going to be in kids, usually between six months and three years. However, I learned recently that that is not in stone. There was a 40-year-old guy um, up around Memphis, a buddy of mine that teaches ACLS for a different company up there. He works on an ambulance and he came across a 40 year old dude that had the croup. So it's not just kids. It's just apparently, you know, 99.9999, mostly kids. The disease will start with a cold, a cough and low grade fever that develops over two days. 
and the hallmark signs of croup are strider and a seal bark cough so whenever they cough it almost sounds like a seal making a sound um and then croup often responds well to administrative humidified oxygen so if you've got those connections with the water you can use that that'll help the bronchodilators are not indicated um they actually can make things worse because bronchodilators will tend to dry out your membranes and that's already part of the problem so you're taking one of this one of the things of croup and you're just adding to it epiglottitis is swelling of the epiglottis this is an upper airway issue um this will cause a slight obstruction in the airway it'll make it harder for your child to breathe um so you'll see them in the tripod position the big thing here is drooling because it's so high up in the airway it's actually sometimes it will trigger the salivary glands like as if you had a piece of steak in your mouth um and so that's something that you'll see bronchiolitis this is a specific viral illness of newborns and toddlers often caused by respiratory syncytial virus this causes inflammation of the bronchioles rsv is highly contagious um and because kids have no real sense of personal bubbles it usually spreads like wildfire virus can survive on surfaces so it's pretty hardy it's up there with like hepatitis and i think um i think covid can live on cold surfaces for a while too it's one of the reasons why even with the masks we're still sometimes seeing a spread uh, the virus tends to spread rapidly through schools and child care centers mostly so one kid gets it a lot of your other kids in the area are going to get it too this is very common in premature infants and results in copious secretions that may require suctioning if you have to suction with a very small very small child don't don't use the hard catheter if you can help it they make soft ones that you can use it's much easier on the airway if they're so small that you can just use the bulb syringe it's even better but if it's you know like a two-year-old or something like that um just use a soft catheter these are most widespread in winter and early spring again it's just seasonal right it's cold people aren't outside playing they're inside playing um, running around in a room that's temperature controlled but now they're breathing and coughing on everything when they run around kids are getting close to each other it spreads more and then the airway can easily become blocked look for signs of dehydration so if they're really young you can look at the fontanelles if they're older then your cap refill your skin turgor that kind of thing and then shortness of breath and fever for your treatment display a calm demeanor when you approach don't scare them um, and also your calmness will keep them calm treat their airway and breathing problems with whatever you need humidified oxygen will help and then consider als backup if um if they really start to get into some respiratory distress pertussis also known as whooping cough so just like how we talked about croup has a weird sound when they cough pertussis does too uh they don't sound like they have they don't sound like a seal what they sound like they sound like they're being hit in the back every time they make a cough no, so it's more percussive, it's hence, hence the name. But this is a result of vaccinations. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, as a result of vaccinations, and we very much rephrase that one. This potentially deadly disease is less common in the United States. So that is straight out of the lesson plan. Um, you do still see it. I don't want you to think that you're never going to come across this. It's just not as common. It used to be very, very common. So it was a lot of times it was misunderstood they thought it was the cold so the signs and symptoms were very similar um a lot of times it wound up being mistaken as the cold and, and for that reason a lot of times parents wouldn't call 911 they would just think all right well we're going to give you some cough medicine and you'll be fine the telltale sign difference though is the sound of the cough and if it gets if it's missed and it gets progressive um the, the coughing will become more severe and that whooping sound is going to get more and more distinctive infants infected with pertussis may develop pneumonia or respiratory failure so again you know unfortunately this is being misunderstood as the cold usually they're going to go from the cold to pneumonia which doesn't really make much sense so it winds up being that your the child actually had pertussis 
not the cold, and, it, and then it extended into um, pneumonia. So keep the airway open, transport, give them oxygen, and just know that it is contagious. Um, so take your standard precautions for that. It's not necessarily airborne, but um, not like TB. But yeah, put a mask on. All right, we're gonna skip through the airway adjuncts. They're the same as, and the oxygen delivery devices. Because they're the same for adults or just smaller. And we're gonna go over all that stuff at boot camp in one fell swoop, it won't be that hard. So we're gonna go up to CPR. Uh, cardiac arrest in infants and children usually is not a problem with their heart. It's gonna be respiratory issues, like we were saying before. So um, keep that in mind. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to change the way we do CPR. You're still going to do CAB compressions first. Um, but as soon as you can get help to where you're doing two rescuer CPR, switch it to 15 to two. That allows you to give twice as many breaths in a certain time span, you know, first cycle or whatever. And hopefully you can get them back. Um, Adults become hypoxic and the heart develops a dysrhythmia that leads to sudden cardiac arrest. Usually the AED is the treatment of choice for that because early on, it winds up being an electrical issue. Children become hypoxic and their hearts slow down. So their issue is that their breathing is the problem. You still need to hook the AED to the, to the child just in case because they could be in a rhythm that can be shockable. But most of the time, that's not going to be the case. You're going to want to be breathing for them if at all possible. So the heart slows down. If it gets to about 60 or less, that is that is as good as dead at that point. They need to be getting compressions. The overall survival rate once they go into cardiac arrest is only 8%. Now I'll say this: um, survival rates for CPR are they're they're measured a little weird. It's not just did you get a pulse back and did they leave the ER. All right, if that were the case, then you'd be looking more like 20, 30%, maybe 40% or whatever. Um, to be considered statistically a, a cardiac arrest survivor, you have to still be alive one year after the cardiac arrest. And they don't take into account what killed you if you don't make it a year. So you, um, you survive cardiac arrest on January 1st. On December 31st of that year, you get run over by an 18-wheeler and you die. Statistically, you don't count toward cardiac arrest survival. That's just the way the AHA does it. Um, they're the ones that usually do the trending and the numbers. So 8% is low, but um, realistically, it's not that low. It's a little bit better than that. Pre-hospital survival rate from respiratory arrest is over 70%. If you can catch it when it's still the respiratory and not cardiopulmonary, uh, they have a very good chance of survival because we can get it, we can bag, bag them in the field, get them to the hospital, they'll put them on a vent, figure out why the respiratory drive dropped out, fix it, and they're good to go. A child who's breathing very poorly with a slowing heart rate must be ventilated with high concentrations of oxygen and transported as soon as possible. And keep an eye on their pulse because um, there's always that high risk that they could go into see in the cardiac arrest on you. So for shock, shock is a condition that develops when the cardi when the circulatory system is unable to deliver amount good um, oxygen rich blood to the body. It may be pumping fine, but if there's no oxygen there, it's not going to do very well. The body compensates just like adults do, but they don't have a lot of the compensation making uh, methods that we do as adults. So, like I said, you know when an adult goes into the shock, their pulse picks up. Their vessels will dilate to try to raise the blood pressure. Um, you know, norepinephrine gets dumped into the system and all that stuff. And the um, the kids just don't have that. The kids, all they have is heart rate. That's it. That's the only, they're a one trick pony. So um, they will do very well keeping a blood pressure, keeping, you know, they'll look fine outwardly. But what you won't notice is that their pulse is steadily ticking higher and higher and higher and higher. And then when the heart starts to give out and the pulse starts to drop, there's no backup to that. That's just, that's it. They, they went from being good compensation to nothing left and they'll crash. Um, 
And that's a scary thing. You have to be careful for that. So if you have a feeling that your your patient may be at risk of shock, um, if you've got somebody for it, I would put somebody on their pulse and just have them watch it at all times. You can put them on a monitor if you've got a monitor, but for the sake of the class, you guys will be all BLS units, so you won't have a monitor. Um, but you will have an infinite number of imaginary friends to help you out, and they're all equally trained. So you can say, I'm going to have a partner watch his pulse, and I'm going to have him keep an eye on it to see if the pulse starts to continually rise, and I'm going to treat for shock. That lets you know, or that would tell me that um, you you know what you're looking for in their compensated shock and also um, what you're going to do to treat it as best as you can. So just remember, compensated shock is early stage. That's where the body is still making up the difference. It's just working hard to do so. If you don't fix the problem, then the, compensate, the compensation efforts are going to fail and then they're going to go into decompensated shock and that's usually where they start to die off on you. In pediatric patients, the most common causes of shock include traumatic injury with blood loss, same as adults, especially abdominal because the abdomen is not fully thickened up and formed yet, so a lot of their abdominal organs are at risk of getting hurt. Um, not to mention, like we said earlier, oh uh, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, class is going to go a little bit after nine. Tonight's going to be a long night, but um, it'll be recorded so you can catch the recording. Dehydration from diarrhea or vomiting. A lot of times kids don't necessarily want to eat or drink anything when they're vomiting. Um, and if parents don't don't think about it or get ahead of that, the child is at high risk of dehydration. Severe infection can occur. Neurologic injuries such as head trauma. A severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis to an allergen can cause this. Um, insect bites, food allergies, things like that. Remember, kids don't really that's a scary time in regards to allergies because a lot of times you don't know until you know and you find out the hard way um a collapsed lung can cause change in pneumothorax that can lead to problems with hypoperfusion blood or fluid around the heart so now we're talking about cardiogenic um where the, the heart just can't beat and then there's a the problem with the pump cardiac tamponade um and pericarditis so that those two are just basically two conditions that is blood or fluid around the heart. If it's a if it's a problem with the um, the fluid around the heart that's causing in the pericardial sac that's causing the heart to not be able to beat because all the fluids compressing down, that's a cardiac tamponade. Pericarditis is where the actual heart muscle is in, is inflamed and swelling, and so it can't beat because it's engorged with whatever is making it swell up. Um, that's the difference between the two. Pediatric patients respond differently than adults to fluid loss. So a lot of times when pediatrics go into um, dehydration, you're going to see their heart rate increase and their respiration, the respirations are going to increase and their skin is going to start to turn pale or blue. Times of shock in kids, we have tachycardia, poor cap refill. Uh, they say greater than two seconds, like I said, take that with a grain of salt. Mental status changes. And then begin treating for shock as soon as you can figure out that they might be going that way. Even if you don't see signs of shock, it hurts absolutely nothing for you to treat for it. Because all it is, is covering them up, loosening restrictive clothing, and that's it. So if you want to treat for shock every single time, okay. It won't hurt them. You're not going to get knocked off for that. If there's an obvious life threat, like an external hemorrhage, then take care of the hemorrhage first, then go and take care of your A and B. If cardiac arrest is suspected, same thing. Compressions first. Pediatric patients in shock often have increased respirations, but do not demonstrate a fall in blood pressure until shock is severe. So I was saying, you know, you'll see where their, their vitals are climbing, but you're not going to see their blood pressure change, which is what we normally think about when we think of shock, is their crashing blood pressure. You really don't see that until the very end. 90% of their time in shock is spent just fine. And in the last 10 minutes, or the last 10% is where they pass out and die on you.
me find my spot and I lost it. All right. Um, screw it, I'll find it. So treating for shock, just like in adults, um, we really can't give them anything IV. That's not the, the scope of practice and the level that we're at as ENTs. So cover them, keep them warm. That's what we're going to do. If you do have to deal with shock in the field, get a paramedic out there as quick as you can because they do need fluids. Um, they may need some other interventions depending on what's causing the shock, that kind of thing. Um, so don't hesitate on calling out ALS and you don't have to wait on the scene. If ALS is 20 minutes away and you're 30 minutes from the hospital, head to the hospital. If anything, the paramedic can meet you along the way. All right. Um, if you're dealing with shock, time is not on your side. So make sure your ABCs are in check and then get them to the hospital. Don't waste time performing field procedures. If you can do it in the truck or on the way, do that. Give your supplemental oxygen. Um, continue to monitor their airway and breathing. If they're continuing to pick up the pace on um, their pulse and breathing, all right, that's not the greatest. It means they're not out of the woods, but I mean, they're not crashing yet. So even if you can just slow that process down, sometimes that's the best you can do. Anaphylaxis, that is extreme um, allergic reaction. This shock caused by an allergic reaction. So their airway is going to be closing off. That's going to be the problem. And you do exactly what you would do for an adult in these. Thankfully, we just have a pediatric version. Hit them with the EpiPen, the pediatric dose, and um, get them to a hospital. Common causes are insect stings, medications, and food allergies that, again, they probably just didn't know that the, the patient had until the first time they had a reaction. Some signs and symptoms include hypoperfusion, which is shock, strider and wheezing, increased work of breathing, altered appearance, um, restlessness, agitation, sometimes a sense of impending doom. When you start to really realize you may not be able to breathe again, that, that impending doom will come. You're going to be like, oh, my God, I'm going to die because I can't breathe. And then hives. Remember, hives are, um, you know, blotches of swelling skin, bumps everywhere, that kind of thing. It's usually a contact in, um, allergy that causes those. So for your treatment, maintain your airway. That's the most important thing because that's what you're going to be fighting is that their airway doesn't close off. Give them oxygen. I know it sounds dumb. They are. I'm just giving them oxygen. But think about what you're doing, right? If it was as easy as just giving them oxygen for the for the hell of it, then there'd be no difference in just letting them breathe regular air. But the problem is, is you're getting a very limited amount into them. So what you do give them, you want it to be as much oxygen as possible. So it is a legitimate, a legitimate intervention, as easy as it sounds. And the best thing about it is, is that it is easy. You're not sitting there having to do drug calculations at two o'clock in the morning. You just give them some oxygen. Count your blessings because it gets much harder. Assist with epi, um, the auto injector, which is what we would use as BLS, and then provide rapid transport. Your epi is only going to last a couple of minutes. So you hit them and they're they're doing much better. That's fantastic, but it's not going to last long. So don't throw the epi pen away. A lot of them have two doses. You may need the second one um, before you leave the house. If it is a known react known allergy, they may have more epi pens. So bring those too, because you may need them depending on how far you are from the hospital. All right, for hemophilia, um, hemophilia is a congenital condition in which the patient lacks one or more of the normal clotting factors of blood. Um, so this just like elderly is gonna be uh, free bleeders, as you as you've heard, you know, where they get a cut and they just can't stop bleeding. Uh, sometimes it can occur spontaneously and it does happen more in the male population, but not all injuries um, are gonna be that serious. Like a paper cut may bleed profusely, but it's not gonna be a life threat. However, something that is normally superficial, say like an act like a legit laceration could become a life threat. You may wind up having to put a lot of four by fours on somebody. You might actually have to tourniquet somebody for a otherwise only moderate cut. Um, 
if it does come, if it looks like you need a tourniquet, don't don't delay it. Go ahead and put it on there. It's not just those aren't just for amputations. All right, five minutes till we're going to take a five minute break. I think it's five minutes till. Yeah, uh, nine o'clock. We'll get back on this, and we're going to pick up with neurological emergencies. We're getting pretty close to to the end of the chapter, but it is definitely a long one. It's going to be a long night. Yeah, about 70 more slides.
All right, continuing on for the next lap of the journey. Neurological issues. Um, so altered mental status with kids, sometimes can be kind of hard to figure out um, because when you're asking them their questions, like you know your orientation to a person, place, event, all that stuff, it's not as easy because sometimes they don't, they, like, all right, for example, who's the president? A six-year-old probably doesn't know. Well, I'll say that in this day and age, probably does. But um, I know that like when I was a kid, I didn't know the president's name. Back in the early 90s, we went from Bush to, to Clinton. I had no idea. Um, we just weren't ate up with it like we are now. But there's a couple ways to check. So we use a mnemonic A-E-I-O-U, so your vowels, tips. Um, and that's what it is right there on the screen. These are the different things that can cause an altered mental status. So signs and symptoms will vary from simple confusion to a coma. You can ask the parent. This is one of those things that's, if they're an adolescent, obviously, yes, you can do a normal um, AMS check. But if they're like five or six or even younger than that, two or three years old, you can ask the parent. Be like, is this normal for them? Do they normally just stare off in the space or not recognize that somebody's in the room? That kind of thing. Because um, if it's not normal, the parent will know and the parent will tell you. But you're going to manage your ABCs if they have an altered level of consciousness and transport. Make sure that they have good oxygen. If it's not a, an unstable patient, you know, there's no problems with the airway or anything like that, then you can just titrate to 94 to 99, whatever amount of oxygen you need to give for that, that's fine. If they're having a hard time breathing and you feel like they can't do it right on their own, then you can use your BVM so that you're breathing for them. But try to default to the uh, non-rebreather or the cannula if they'll, if they'll take it. Um, again, some kids won't, and we're going to talk about different ways you can do that at the boot camp, but ultimately get into the hospital. Seizures, um, same as seizures in adults. The only thing is to just understand that kids can get them for various reasons other than lifelong issues like epilepsy. Um, when, when children are teething, they can get some really out of this world fevers and then that can cause febrile seizures. Um, in infants, the seizures can be really, really subtle. I was watching, I remember a video that I had to watch in school myself that was pretty difficult because you had this little baby sitting there and he's like, I'm like, oh, he's so cute, you know, all that stuff. And then all of a sudden he like, he makes a little twitch. And I, I didn't even notice it at first. And he twitches again. And, um, the baby, the baby himself starts to realize that, wait a minute, that's, that's not me. And he twitches again. These are full body, like his arms and his legs are yanking in. Um, and then like for the third twitch, the baby starts to really realize that something's wrong. And so the baby gets this really concerned look and then it starts to cry and the twitching continues. And it, it was subtle, but it was enough. That, I mean, if you want, if you're watching for it, like you can see like, what the hell is that? That kind of thing. It wasn't like seeing an adult flop like a fish. It was just a little twitch and then another jerk. And a couple seconds later, another jerk. But the infant knew, the baby knew because the baby started crying. Like, you know, what, what is going on kind of thing. Um, but the older the person gets, the more obvious the seizure can get. The more obvious the muscle contractions can be. Common causes, child abuse, electrolyte imbalance, fever, like I said, is real big for kids. Hypoglycemia, uh, infection, ingestion, if they ate something they shouldn't have ate or drank it. Lack of oxygen is big. So if they're having a seizure because of hypoxia, that should, like I said, alarm bells, hey, respiratory. Medications, poisoning, seizure disorder, recreational drug use if they're older. Even, well, I say, you know, young kids typically don't do that kind of stuff, but depending on the environment they're in, they may. Head trauma, and um, sometimes we just don't know. Like, there's no cause that we can find. They may manifest in a variety of ways, depending on the age of the child. They may be something like absence seizures, where they just kind of stare off into space, and if it's an infant, you'll never know. But... Um, and it can go on to being full blood, you know, full body muscle contractions, that kind of thing. The post state is over once normal level of consciousness is regained. So from the time the seizure stops 
until the time they are back to normal. That's your post fecal state. So that whole part where they're starting to come to and they're not really back on their feet yet, but they're they're starting to wake up. That's still the post fecal state. Status epilepticus, the same as an adult. That's where the seizure just doesn't stop. Um, we can't stop the seizure, so we need ALS. They can. Um, the biggest thing that we need to do is make sure that we clear, like move things out of the way, make sure they don't hit their head, try to maintain their airway as best we can. If we need to suction, we can suction, but be careful about putting things in somebody's mouth during a seizure because they can bite it off. So an example would be if you want, if you ever wanted to know what it was like to have nine fingers, put one of them inside of a seizing patient's mouth and you may find out. Recurring or prolonged seizures should be considered life-threatening, if even if it's not status epilepticus, where they are just straight stuck in a seizure. If it's if they're going into another seizure before they make it out of the post state from the previous one, that's a life threat. So get ALS out there as quick as you can. So management is easy for BLS. Like I said, just move stuff out of the way. Don't let them hurt themselves. Um, don't put anything in their mouth. Try to maintain their airway when they go post -tictal. You can suck in their airway, that kind of thing. Give them oxygen. Use a BVM if they're not breathing, and then get them to a hospital. Some caregivers, especially if they have a um, if they have a history of seizures, some caregivers will have already given a rectal dose of diazepam to a to a child. Um, just monitor their breathing and level of consciousness because that's a sedative. It's great for knocking out seizures, but it's not the fastest acting. Um, it's just the easiest to give. So watch their breathing and everything because it's going to depress. As they as that medicine takes effect, it's going to bring down their vitals as well as the seizure. You want to make sure that you don't miss the need to bag them, for example, and then transport them to the hospital. For meningitis, uh, this is the inflammation of the meninges in the brain, like I was talking about. So when this happens, it increases the pressure in the head. Um, it can start to put pressure on where the, on the brain stem and where the spinal cord meets it at the foramen magnum, which can make it hurt when the patient tries to move their head. Um, it can cause it can cause their pain receptors to flare up. Uh, this can be bacterial or viral. And one of the issues that we've run into, we're, there's a whole bit of emerging science out there that's saying that um, giving antibiotics to children under a certain age is actually causing some harm in other areas. Um, besides what's, you know, besides the problem that it's fixing. The issue is, is in the field, if you're treating meningitis in the field, you have no idea whether it's going to be viral or bacterial. Um, just know that the bacterial is a much bigger risk, I believe. So uh, children with shunts, pins, or other foreign bodies within their brain or spinal cord are at risk of these. If left untreated, it can kill them or cause irreversible damage. Some other individuals at risk, you have males, newborns, AIDS, cancer victims, um, children who have any history of brain, spinal cord, or back surgery, head trauma. If they have any, um, where is it, the shunts? Some signs and symptoms of meningitis can vary. Um, a lot of times it will mimic the flu, but it will also come with a couple extra things, like it will cause some, a stiff neck. Um, patients with meningitis tend to not want to move their head very much. They, it hurts them to do so. They'll have that fever, altered level of consciousness. That's common in all ages. The child may experience a seizure, uh, which may be the first sign of meningitis. Sometimes a seizure is the first thing that you're going to notice. If it's an infant, they can have apnea where they stop breathing, cyanosis, fever again, and it's a distinct high-pitched cry. So remember when I said earlier that we're listening to different types of cries, and if it sounds like there's a like a shriek of pain, then that, and that's their cry, that that meant something specific, um, this is it. All right, we're worried about meningitis at that point. If you walk in and they are just like, they're not crying, they're screaming, screeching, 
that's going to be a meningitis sign. Um, and then, of course, the stiff neck. One sign of meningitis in an infant is an increasing irritability and a bulging fontanelle without crying. So we talked about the fontanelles earlier, and y'all mentioned crying could cause a bulge. That's true. Um, bulging without the crying, though, is usually because of an increasing pressure inside the skull, which could be meningitis. So I'm not even going to try to mention it or read it. There's the name of the bacterium that causes meningitis bacterially. Um, they can never name anything. They can't make it easy. They can never make it easy. But anyway, um, this is a bacterium that causes a rapid onset of meningitis symptoms and often leading to shock and death. This is the worst of the two. The, the bacterium is fast acting. Um, and the problem with it is that by the time they realize something's wrong and they call the ambulance out, it's, it can be too late. Typically, you're going to have small pinpoint cherry red spots or a large purple black rash on the face or the body. And children with this are at a serious risk of sepsis, shock, and death. So there's a there's an example there. You're going to start to see that stuff pop up all over the place because it's it's a systemic thing, right? All right. So, ooh, that's not a good sounded good. wonder if that's going to make it on the recording. Treatment for children with suspected meningitis is going to be pretty much copious amounts of diesel. Give them oxygen um, just so that the brain has a surplus to work with while it's struggling with what else is in there with it. And give ventilations if you need to, but it's ultimately just reassess and get them to a hospital. Um, there's not really anything we can do other than just try to limit the, the progression for GI emergencies, never take a complaint of abdominal pain lightly because a large amount of the bleeding may occur within the abdominal cavity without any outward signs of shock. Remember, 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 the reason we talked about anatomy in this is because for children, their organs are more anterior. They haven't recessed close to the spine yet. Um, if they get hit in the stomach, fall on something, that kind of thing, there's a really high chance that they may cause a rupture of it, some of their organs Depending on what they hit, they're smaller in general. So a, a, a blunt force hit could rupture every one of their organs, and then they're just going to bleed out, and they may never lose a drop to the ground. Monitor for signs and symptoms of shock. Um, keep an eye out for altered mental status, pool, or pale, cool skin, fast breathing, fast heart rate, all that stuff. Complaints of GI origin are common in pediatric patients. A lot of times they're just going to say their stomach hurts. That's really... All they think about they, this entire area from the base of your ribs to the waistline of your pants is your stomach, according to a child. So it's my stomach. OK, you know, all the way through teenager. That's um, that could be any number of things and most likely is not the stomach. But in most cases, speed after patient will be experiencing abdominal discomfort with nausea and vomiting and or diarrhea. When that's the case, um, a lot of times that's a good thing. That's usually going to be their actual GI tract. It may be food poisoning, that kind of thing. Um, appendicitis is also common. If it's untreated, it can lead to peritonitis or shock. And depending, it can also kill you. Um, peritonitis is inflammation of the peritoneum, which lines the abdominal cavity. This will typically present with a fever and pain on the palpation of the right lower abdominal quadrant. You're gonna have that rebound tenderness too. So when you're palpating, remember, when you press down, they might actually say that it feels better. Like you'll see a sigh of relief until you move your hands. And then it all comes back with a vengeance. If you suspect appendicitis, promptly transport to the hospital for further evaluation. They're probably going to need surgery, especially if it ruptures. Um, obtain a thorough history from the primary caregiver if you can. And in particular, ask questions like, you know, how many wet diapers has a child had today? If it's GI related, um, their kidneys may be shutting down or they may, the, if it's like, for example, let's say it's um, electrolyte. If the body has got too few electrolytes, the first thing the kidneys do is they stop peeing because, or they stop producing urine because it's trying to hold on to the electrolytes that it's got. Is your child tolerating liquids? Can they keep them down? How many times has your child had diarrhea and for how long? If you're worried about some kind of a stomach infection or food poisoning, 
Um, you notice most of these have to do with their ability to be hydrated. Are tears present during crying? Because if they're not, that means the child is dehydrated. For poisoning, um, this is common during a certain time, well, we'll say a certain age group of children. Um, early on, it's usually because they're just exploring. They don't realize that that bottle of bleach is going to kill them. Later on, um, poisoning in, in adolescence is either usually, I'll say not all the time, but usually it's either going to be um, recreational um, on accident. They didn't mean to take that much, or it could be self-harm, uh, that kind of thing. But either, either way, though, keep an eye out. Just know that with adolescence, the poisoning may be a secondary issue. There may be something more underlying that's going on. But this can occur by ingesting, inhaling, injecting, or absorbing a toxic substance. Common sources include alcohol, aspirin and, and Tylenol, cosmetics, household cleaning products, especially if they're younger, um, or if it is a self-harm issue. House plants, um, oleanders, that's it. I think, I think I tried to remember that name earlier in the year, or earlier in the class. There's a plant. Um, Really pretty plant. My mom loved them. She had them all over the house when I was a teenager. Uh, and she would love to make us be the ones, me and my sister, to get out and go take care of all the plants all the time, except those. Wouldn't let us anywhere near them. Because the oil on the oleander leaf, if I got it on my hands and then didn't wash them before I went to get food or something like that, the the, um, the oil from that plant could kill me. Is is highly toxic. So you know, but like I said, they're a pretty plant. They, they bloom real nice and big and all that stuff. And if your house has them and your kid gets around it, um, they don't look threatening at all. So it's not like looking at a cactus. You're not going to be like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't touch that one. Um, it's a deceptive plant. So it can people can make that mistake, especially kids. But anyway, um, iron, you can have too much iron. Prescription medications, illicit street drugs, and vitamins. Signs and symptoms of poisoning can vary. It really just depends on what it is. So um, it also depends on the height, or the age, and the weight of the child. Um, one of the best things that you can do is just call poison control. Your patient may appear normal at first, and then they start to have their um, level of consciousness drop after a while. It depends on how soon you get to them. If they took it a while before you got the call, like say somebody tried to do a suicide attempt, they took all the pills, um, they may not be the one to call you. It could be somebody who sees the effect already starting, and then they call 911. You show up, and you're behind the curve. If it's an accidental overdose or an accidental poisoning, sometimes they'll call you a little bit faster. You get there before the symptoms get out of hand. Be alert for signs of abuse. After you've completed your primary assessment, ask the parent or the caregiver, um, you know, what substance was it, if they know, sometimes it's bleach or whatever it could be, old mop water that they didn't dump, who knows, approximately how much of the substance was ingested or involved in the exposure, what time did the incident occur, was this, um, and keep in mind too, like if they did it near a meal time, sometimes the food can absorb it. And so the body may not actually try to process all of it. It's still a problem, but it may help a little bit. Um, are there any changes in behavior or, or LOC? Was there any choking or coughing after the exposure? Because you want to worry about airway issues there. If it causes any kind of bronchospasm or um, potential airway issues, contact poison control for assistance, like I was saying. And to treat you're going to first perform an external decon, so get any excess poison off of them or out of their mouth if it's still hanging around in their mouth. Remove any tablets, wash or brush poison from the skin, assess and maintain your ABCs, give oxygen, and transport. If your child demonstrates signs of shock, you're going to treat for that. Um, keep them warm, loosen restrictive clothing. They do make activated, obviously, they make activated charcoal that you can give orally. Um, that's kind of going away because it really doesn't do anything. If it's a skin contact, you can use, they make these, um, they're like gloves, but they have charcoal on them. And the charcoal is not to protect you. The charcoal is actually on the outside of the glove so that you take that, you put it on your hand, 
and you pat it down all over the patient where they got the chemical on their skin and it helps to absorb it and get it off of them better. Um, that's a good water alternative if it happens to be something that's water reactive. So you don't cause all the burns to your patient that comes with water reactive stuff coming in contact with water. All right, I'm not going to bother with this slide. Activated charcoal has been removed from the curriculum. It's on the way out. A lot of your agencies don't use it anymore either. So I'm not going to make you know how to mix it or anything like that. For dehydration emergencies, dehydration occurs when fluid loss is greater than fluid intake. That's as easy as it gets. So if they're having vomiting and diarrhea, but they're not drinking any water, they're going to dehydrate. If they're just going to the bathroom and they're not drinking any water because they don't feel good, they're going to dehydrate. Infants and children are at a much higher risk than adults for dehydration um, just because the fluid reserves are a lot smaller. They're smaller people. Life-threatening dehydration can overcome an infant in a matter of hours, and dehydration can be mild, moderate, or severe. That much is the same as adults. But the easiest way for you to tell is by looking at your patient. So mild dehydration is going to be dry lips and gums. Moderate is more like sunken eyes, sleep, uh, sleepiness, irritability. So you're going to have to start to get those altered level of consciousness. Loose skin, I call it, this is called skin turgor, where like if you grab them by the arm and you pinch up a little bit of their skin, when you let it go, it should snap back into place. Um, if you pinch it up and you let it go and it stays in that pinched position for a little bit, that's poor skin turgor. That's what the loose skin, you know, sunken fontanelles, all that good stuff. Severe dehydration, you're going to have mottled, cool, clammy skin, um, delayed cap refill, and an increased respiration. Treatment is a lot of it's the same. You're just going to assess their ABCs, make sure your primary is good, get a set of vitals. If the dehydration is severe, call ALS because they can give an IV and push fluid right then and there. Um, if it's not severe or if you think you can get into the hospital and, and nothing worse is going to happen, then go ahead and just transport. For fever emergencies, um, fever is pretty much just anything over 100.4. And now that's the same for adults now, but I'll say this, children can have a fever much higher than adults and it not be that big of a deal. So if a child's running 101, 102 fever, okay, you know, figure out why. Sometimes just teething can cause that, but um, it's not like an adult. If an adult's running with a 101, 102 fever, they're probably going to, their brain's going to melt. I mean, it's just, we don't, we don't handle the temperature change well at all. Our body is much more fine-tuned. Um, if something is dragging our temperature that high, that's a life threat. If a child's is that high, it's just an inconvenient sickness. They may need to go to the hospital. And if it gets up to like 103, 104, something like that, well, then, yeah, we need to do some real cooling down. But um, fever by itself, especially in children, they can stand a higher number. But some causes are in infection, status epilepticus, cancer, drug ingestion, arthritis, uh, systemic lupus can do it, high environmental temperatures. And then, like I said, sometimes they'll get fevers because they're teething. The body mistakes it for an infection and tries to burn things out. Uh, fever is not the sickness. Understand what a fever is. Your fe a fever is your body's response to a sickness. That's your body's attempt to get rid of something. And it may be something that's not really there. That's why, like I said, teething is an issue. Um, when they have a fever, the body is trying to raise its core temperature. So during the fever, the child or even an adult for that matter, but the child is going to feel very cold. They're going to be shivering. They, they will, no matter how many blankets you throw on them, they're going to feel cold. They're, they're going to feel a little tired, a little muscle sore because their muscles are probably shivering a little bit to try to create more heat and raise their, their core temperature up. Once the fever breaks and the body is trying to cool off, they're going to suddenly feel all that heat. And that's when they start sweating it off. So for fever progression, if you all weren't, if you didn't already know, um, during the fever, you just can't get warm. No matter how much you throw on you, no matter what you do, get into a hot tub, whatever, you just can't get warm. And then when the fever breaks, is what they say, 
that's when suddenly you're sweating like a stuck pig. You just can't. Now you're you're burning up. You're like, oh god. And you see it on TV when they're sweating, sweating bullets and all that stuff. That that part, that's the fever already done. The fever is done at that point. Your body's returning to normal. Um, yeah. Anyway, I digress. Accurate body temperature is important. Uh, some things to keep in mind if you're going to take a temperature in the like at the neck or the armpits, um, the temperature reading usually comes back a little cooler than what the body really is. So you give yourself an extra point or two. It says 100. It's probably a 101, 102. If um, if you check the mouth, it's more accurate. But the most accurate is rectal. And we don't really do that in the field. If you need to, you can. Um, just don't mix up your thermometers. Febrile seizures can occur. Um, it's on the wrong slide. Yeah, there we go. Febrile seizures can occur in kids. This is where they get a fever that's so high they go into a seizure. If that happens, don't let the fact that it's a febrile seizure mess you up. It's still just a seizure. So treat it as such. Um, just understand that it probably came from the fever. So if you get home, if you get called out because a child had a seizure and mom is freaking out or dad's freaking out or whatever, because, oh my God, you know, Johnny had a, Johnny just had a seizure. We've never had this before. We don't know what's going on. And you ask him like, well, has he been sick lately? Has he been running a fever? Well, yeah, he's, he was he was sick. He came home. He's had a fever earlier. And like, well, that's that's what it was. And the cool thing, or not cool thing, but the good thing about those is that they are only there because of the fever. So once whatever that sickness is moves on, usually the seizures are going to stop. And you can you can reassure the parents with that, that most likely this was a febrile seizure. Um, this is common in kids. When they get seizures this high. As soon as whatever it is passes, the seizures will pass with it. But let's go ahead and go to the hospital just to make sure, you know, because they can run tests and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, these seizures usually don't last long. Uh, they very rarely go into status epilepticus. And when they're done, when the seizure is done, the child pops right out of it. There's no real post state. If this is what you got, your assessment is all the same. Focus on your ABCs, give oxygen. You can try to cool them down. If they're if their seizure is so high that I'm sorry, if their fever is so high that they got a seizure, uh, this is one of those times where you may need to cool them off. So you can use um, wet rags, you know, lukewarm water, wet a couple of rags, rinse them off so that you don't have a bunch of standing water on the kid. Uh, put it around their neck, maybe underneath their armpits or something like that and one between their legs and the groin area and that will cool them off very well it'll help break that fever and then take them to the hospital the thing about febrile seizures is is even though they're they're common and they usually do only last while the fever is really high um some, something's having to cause that right there's some reason why they got a, a fever that high the seizure is not necessarily the problem it's the sickness that caused the seizure Something, something's going on. They got a sickness of some sort of an, an infection or whatever um, that may need to be taken care of. And since the only way to get antibiotics is to get it from a doc, they need to go to the doctor. Uh, whether they go with you in the ambulance or, you know, if it's two o'clock in the afternoon and, and they can go to an urgent care or go to their family doctor, that's fine too. But they, you definitely don't want them to just go back to watching X-Files or whatever's on TV. Yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> All right. Um, drowning. In drowning emergencies, you always must take steps to ensure your own safety. You want to make sure that whatever caused them to drown, you don't want to fall into it as well. Like say they fell into a uh, a frozen lake, which we're going to get to hypothermia in a little bit. But um, you don't want to get stuck in it because that's an environmental emergency. Anytime you have an environmental emergency, you want to make sure that that environment is not going to get you at the same time. Drowning is the second most com common cause of unintentional death among children aged one to four. Children often fall into swimming pools and lakes, but many drown in bathtubs and even just puddles or buckets of water. If um, if they fall asleep or if something happens and they pass out, the only thing that's really got to get underwater is their mouth and nose. 
You know, you don't have to be completely submerged in a hundred, you know, in the middle of the ocean to drown. So sometimes it takes very little. Uh, the principal condition that results from drowning is lack of oxygen. So that's what you're fighting for. They used to change things around, or they used to call things near drownings and blah, blah, blah. They've simplified it finally. So there's just, you either drowned or you didn't, which is good for semantics because it gets confusing on tests when you got to remember all this near drowning BS and stuff. Um, even a few minutes without oxygen affects the heart, lungs, and the brain, especially when we're dealing with kids. Remember how fast things can change when their respiratory drive falls out? Submersion in icy water can lead to hypothermia, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And most people in this situation, they don't make it, unfortunately. They just, that's, that's it. Um, diving into water increases the risk of a neck or spine injury, especially if they're diving in the shallow end of a pool. Um, a lot of people take for granted how far below the surface of the water they'll go before it slows them down or they angle up or any of that stuff. And they wind up hitting the bottom of a pool or... You know, if it's murky water in a, in, a, in a river or a creek and they dive, they think that they've got a good spot, but they, they're too close to shore. Um, it, it happens a lot. Signs and symptoms will vary based on the type and length of the submersion. So a pediatric patient may present with coughing, choking, airway obstruction. These are the, the easy ones, and it's going to get worse. Difficulty breathing, abnormal mental status, uh, seizures, unresponsiveness. Fast, slow, no pulse, pale cyanotic skin, and abdominal distension, which would be water, basically causing that. For management, assess their ABCs, contact ALS. Um, there's really not a lot we can do, even at ALS level, to get water out of somebody's lungs. Uh, it's going to take a doctor, usually a chest tube, something to start draining all that water out. But the problem is, is... In that time span, they're probably not going to make it. Um, administer 100% oxygen via non-rebreather. You can bag them if you need to. Be prepared to suction if, if the, as the patient usually vomits. If trauma is suspected, apply a C collar just like you would for any other trauma. Put them on a longboard. So the, in these cases, they will get a longboard. Pad all open spaces because that's kind of where the problem, that's where longboards kind of went, went away. Because we weren't padding them. And then that was causing different um, pressure points on the spine that caused asphyxiation. So when you, if you do put somebody on a board, take some sheets, take some towels or whatever, and pad all the open spaces. Try to make it where they just there's no open gaps. It's almost like a form-fitting board rather than a straight piece of plastic. And then get them to the hospital. Perform CPR if you need to. Um, if they do have water in their lungs, sometimes the chest compressions will help get some of that stuff out. And you may not get 100% clear lungs, but if just any little bits of that, of the lungs get to where they can accept the air again, it'll help. All right, we are getting close. Pediatric trauma emergencies and management. Unintentional injuries are the number one killer of children in the United States. Quality of care in the first few minutes um, can have an enormous impact on the child's chances for complete recovery. Muscles and bones are still growing well into adolescence. When we talked about the growth plate, stuff like that, a lot of the skeleton of children is cartilage. And in a, in a way, it's really good. They're still flexible, right? That's a great thing, especially during childbirth. Um, you don't want them to come out of the birth canal with fully formed bones. Uh, for one, they won't be able to get any bigger because the bones are already formed. And for two, they're probably going to break. Like lots and lots of bones would break if they were all solid during birth. Older children and adolescents are prone to long bone fractures. Um, they are getting their skeletons more formed at that point. But they're also, a lot of it is because they take more risks during physical activities. Whereas kids don't necessarily, like little kids don't necessarily do that. Children are smaller than adults, therefore the locations of their injuries may differ from that of the adults for the same type of crash. For example, if a um, if an adult gets hit by the front end of a Mitsubishi 3000 GT, because I've seen that, um, they usually get taken out at the knee, a little bit below it. If a six-year-old gets hit by that same car, it's going to be more of a hip fracture, um, massive abdominal injuries. You know, that kind of thing. Just because they're low, they're smaller, they're lower to the ground. 
because the child's head is proportionally larger than an adult's. And it's, and it's not that the child's head is bigger than an adult's. It's that the child's head is bigger in proportion to the rest of their body. It exerts greater stress on the neck, so it takes a little bit less impact to cause the same to cause more damage than what would than what it would take to do um, similar in an adult. So if if a child got hit center mass and it was bad enough to yank him off his feet, um, the damage to his C-spine could be pretty severe. And it could happen worse or, or or even just more easily than it would for an adult. Children are often injured because of their underdeveloped judgment and their lack of experience. So always assume the child has serious head injuries or neck injuries. And we've mentioned it before. Um, when children, if a child walks out into the street, they don't look both ways. If a, if a vehicle come up and it's going to hit them and it honks its horn, the child is going to turn toward the vehicle. It's like a curiosity thing. It's, oh, something's trying to get my attention, and they turn toward it. It's a little bit of ignorance, a little bit of curiosity. They don't know what's coming until it's too late and they get smacked. So most of the damage is going to be on the front of them. Um, if they are, if it's an adult that's walking out in the middle of the street or ran out for some reason and they hear that, we're a little bit more inclined to know what that means and we know what's coming and we know it's not good. So I don't want to see this wreck coming. We turn away from it. And so most of our injuries are on the backside. Um, that's an injury pattern that you're going to keep in mind. Keep in mind, a lot of times children are riding bikes. So if they get hit while they're on a bike, the injury is going to be lower on them, most likely around their legs because they're lifted up a little bit there on the bike. And then the area of the greatest injury varies depending on the size of the child and the height of the bumper at the time of the impact. But usually, um, depending on if they're on, their, on, on foot, on a bike, um, it could be high injury impacts to the head, to all the way down to the legs. It also, you know, is there a difference between it being a sports car that hit them or an F-250 that hit them, um, a fire truck, you know, whatever, just something big. Remember to immobilize the C-spine when caring for children with sports-related injuries. The helmets sometimes are good for that, but um, sometimes the helmet's got to come off. So. Make sure you know what your protocols are for that. Injuries to specific body systems. So we're going to start basically with the head to toe. Um, head injuries are common in kids because they're the bigger size to the body. If a child, if a two-year-old, for example, falls off the top of a cabinet, it's probably going to land on his head. If a 10-year-old falls, falls off the top of a cabinet, however they got up there, um, you're probably going to land on their feet. So think about the different like weight distribution. Um, scalp and facial vessels may cause a great deal of blood loss if not controlled. Just like always, there's just a ton of vessels there feeding those nerves and muscles and all that stuff. Uh, nausea and vomiting are common signs and symptoms of a head injury in children, usually much more on the vomiting side than the nausea. If you see nausea, um, Typically, the two go together with GI, but sometimes you can have that nausea as well with a head injury. It just depends. I've just, in my experience, um, most of my head injuries haven't had nausea. They've had they've had vomiting, but it was because of the the head injury. It's easy to mistake for abdominal injury or illness. So if you're looking at it, try to figure, try to differentiate it. Did they get hit? Did they hit their head? Um, and if you if you can't make the decision, then go with the the greater risk. Go with the head injury. And if it is just GI, well, you know, better to be a little over over aggressive and treat the worst option than under aggressive and let the worst option kill them. Wrong way. All right, that's the nausea and vomiting slide. There we go. Spinal immobilization is necessary for all children who have possible head or spinal injuries after a traumatic event. Immobilization can be difficult because of child's body proportions, but we make stuff that's for their size, so it's not that bad. Um, we do have pediatric C collars. We have KEDs, which you guys are going to get to use. We have short boards, long boards, no boards, you know, whatever we need to use. It's, it's fine. It can be a little difficult. Um, 
But as long as you're using the stuff that's meant for the child, it's really not that bad. At around 8 to 10 years of age, children no longer require padding underneath the torso. They can just lie flat on the board. Padding will be required along the side so the child can be properly secured on the, on the adult sized board. So if you think about it, if you've got a board that's wide enough for somebody with my shoulder uh, span, for example, and you put a six year old on it, there's gonna be a large gap between each of their arms and the edge of the board. So take a sheet, two sheets, roll them up, put one on each side of the child so that when you put those straps over the, um, to, set the to put the child in place, those sheets fill a lot of gaps and that the child doesn't slide left and right on the board. Chest injuries are the same. Um, usually it's going to wind up being blunt trauma that causes injury to a child, not necessarily penetrating. But again, depending on where you work, if you work in bad neighborhoods where drive-bys are a thing and, and stuff like that, you never know. Just because a child wasn't part of, the, of a gunfight doesn't mean they didn't get shot. Um, if they're running with scissors or playing with knives, you know, those kind of things that can cause penetrating trauma. So it's not un, it's not out of the question. It's just not as common. Chest wall flexibility in children can produce a flail chest. Um, keep this in mind as you assess a child who has sustained a high energy blunt trauma. If it's bad enough to break their ribs, then um, you're going to want to look for that. Even though there may be no external sign of injury, these, there may be injuries within the chest. If their rib cage is still mostly cartilage, it doesn't do as good of a job of deflecting that energy transfer. So the lungs can take some damage, the heart can take some damage, and you won't see. And, and the ribs themselves may not break. You may not see any outward signs. Abdominal injuries are common. Uh, children can compensate for significant blood loss better than adults, but again, only for so long. The good thing about adults is, is you can see that decomp coming for a while. Kids are going to be like, ah, you know, I got hit in the stomach, but I'm okay. I feel okay, mom, you know, or whatever. And they and you look at their vitals and you're like, hey, right, you know, heart rate's a little high, and and most people are going to be like, heart rate's a little high. That could just be because he's in pain, and you know, all right, well, if y'all are confident, we'll let him go. And then y'all leave and child goes into decompensated shock and dies after you're gone. So make sure that you don't um, don't forget that that's a red flag. All right. Monitor all children for signs of shock. And you're really looking at the pulse because for kids, that's the only thing they have to compensate with. So um, watch for that rising pulse. If it's high. Me personally, I would kind of waste time on the scene, talk with the kid, try to calm him down. We're like, all right, well, I mean, I'm going to get out of here in just a minute. I just, um, you know, so tell me about what you, you know, you like, you like skateboarding, that kind of thing, whatever it was that they did, they got him hurt. Talk to him, get their mind off of the call, off of the injury, um, and then check their pulse again. And if the pulse is still high, even after they have, you have visibly calmed them down a little bit, that differentiates you know, high pulse from pain and, and anxiety versus compensation for shock. In which case, I'd be like, all right, cool. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get ready to go. Um, I need to talk. I'm going to just want to ask your mom a quick question real quick on my way out, if you can just follow me. And then um, let the mom know. Look, I don't want to scare the kid. I don't want to scare you. However, his pulse is still high. It's a sign of shock. Um, really don't feel good leaving him here. I think we need to get him to the hospital and then get him there. All children with abdominal injuries should be monitored for signs and symptoms of shock, including a weak, rapid pulse, cold, clammy skin. These are the, the late signs, right? And you're not going to get these for long. They're going to just start crashing on you. Decreased cap refill, confusion, and decreased systolic blood pressure. If the patient shows signs or symptoms of shock, prevent hypothermia by keeping the patient warm with blankets and loosen up some restrictive clothing. Um, that's just... That is treating for shock. So again, doesn't hurt you to do it, even if they don't need it. All right, for burns. Burns to children are generally considered more serious than burns to adults. Uh, it just, they're so much smaller. They don't have the, 
it's it's easier to burn a lot of their body, you know, the size of the fire versus the size of the person. Children also don't tolerate burns as well as adults do. Uh, children are also more likely to go into shock, develop hypothermia, and experience airway problems. The most common ways in which children are burned, exposure to hot substances like uh, hot water. My son did that not long ago. He was trying to get something out of the microwave that was a little warm, and he spilled it on himself as he was pulling it down, and it was almost boiling water. So that was a bad day. Um, hot things on a stove. Some kids don't know what's going on at the top of a stove. They just see that handle sticking over the edge, and they're like, oh, look, I'm going to grab this. They pull whatever's cooking down on them. Um, exposure to caustic substances such as cleaning solvents or paint thinners can do it. Older children are more likely to be burned by flames from fire. So if they're, you know, they're out having a bonfire or something like that, drinking, having a good time, one dares the other one to run across the fire without his shoes on or something like that, and then it just it's all downhill from there. Not that I've ever done that. Um, you should expect possible inter internal injuries when you see a child with burns around the mouth or face. And an infection is a common problem following a burn injury to a child. Anytime you have that skin break, infection becomes a major issue. So that's one of the things that we need to watch out for. And again, you know, yes, infection is, is for the longest time, and you can even still say it these days, infection is really the hospital's concern to fix because we don't see the infection in EMS. However, that does not mean that we don't need to worry about it. So do the right things as far as like if you need a sterile field, for example, if we set an IV, we need to create as much of a sterile field as we can around what we're doing. Um, OB kits when we're giving, when we're delivering babies, same thing, sterile field. You even wear different gloves when you're doing a childbirth. They, they're in the pack. Um, you know, we do what we can to try to stop that infectious spread because we may not be the ones to fix an infection but a lot of times we are the ones that cause the infection and we need to stop being that way so your severity burn severity of your burns are going to be the same we it doesn't matter if they're an adult or a child you have your mild minor moderate and severe so um superficial, partial thickness, full thickness, or first, second, third degree, whatever you want to call it. They've changed it a few times, but it all means the same thing. The rule of nines still applies. Um, it is a little different the way that it's written out on on patients, but or on pediatrics, but it's it's so close to being the exact same. It's you're fine. If the patient shows signs and symptoms of shock, prevent hypothermia by keeping him or her warm in blankets. A lot of times you're gonna see that for massive body surface area burns that are third degree if it's a superficial burn um, or even a partial thickness they they can still maintain their core temperature but um large scale second degree large scale third degree those kind of things they're not going to be able to do so hot with that injuries to the extremities children have immature bones we talked about that. Most of it's still cartilage. It's actually not that easy for kids to break bones, but it's not impossible either. The biggest thing that we need to worry about is going to be the growth plate, but we can't do anything about it in the field. So as far as injuries to the extremities go, um, you're going to treat it the same. You're going to stabilize. You can try to reset if you're worried about them not having a pulse. The thing is, is I just want you to be aware of the differences physiologically. All right. So know about the growth plate. Know what that means. Know why we need to worry about that try to figure out where the break is if the break is midline femur you're not really anywhere near a growth plate if um if the break is near a joint uh, then yeah you're kind of close to one so you want to be very careful make sure that you are very very careful when you're setting or not setting but stabilizing the joint um immobilizing things you want to try not to do any more damage than you possibly can because if you pop that plate they're not going to grow. That bone is done. They're not going to, it's not going to grow anymore. Generally, extremity injuries in children are managed in the same manner, like I said. Um, painful deformed limbs with evidence of broken bones should be splinted. You can stabilize and immobilize joints. For pain management, the first step is rec recognizing that the patient is in pain. That's sounds easy. 
and when it's an adult or an adolescent, it is because they're going to be shouting profanities and screaming and all that stuff. But infants, for example, um, not so easy because if they're crying regardless, how do you know if they're in pain? So we use the Wong Baker scale with the faces. We use, um, like I said, ask, sometimes you can tell. Like there's a difference between uh, a cry from pain and a cry because your diaper's wet. Uh, if you can't tell the difference, then ask the mom or the dad. They they hear the cries all the time. They'll know when something's different. But usually you can you can tell. Um, as EMTs, unfortunately, we are limited for the pain interventions. We can't give it's not like you can give them any morphine, right? But you don't want to do that to a kid anyway. But um, positioning, ice packs, extremity elevation, those are going to be the things that we mainly do. Sometimes, depending on what's causing the pain, that's all you need to do is just reposition. These interventions will decrease the pain and swelling to the injury site. Uh, if it does take more, you can consider having ALS come out to give them some real meds, knock them out, make them loopy, you know, whatever. Um, and then another important tool is kindness and pre providing emotional support. Sometimes you just gotta, they just, there's nothing you can do for the pain, like a burn. There ain't nothing you can do for a burn for pain in the in the field. They need to be um, like literally almost put down to get that pain to go away. So, you know, try your best to um, be calm. Just have a good a good manner with you. And a lot of times that's all you need. Okay, so we're getting close to being done. I know it's almost time for a break. I'm going to see how far I make it in 10 minutes. Take a little bit. And then actually, I may not even break. Give me a second. Nah, actually. Um, I'm close enough. We'll just we'll just power through this. Like I said, if y'all get tired, if you got something else to do, this is being recorded. You can always come back and catch the end. Um, I don't want you to feel like you gotta stick around for the whole thing if you're busy. But we're gonna talk about disaster management, um, triage for pediatric. So the Jumpstart Triage system was actually meant for kids. All right, this is talking a little bit about MCIs and stuff, but mostly this is for this is not for like adults. This is intended for patients younger than eight and weighing less than 100 pounds. There's four triage categories in the Jumpstart system. They're designed by colors, so you have um, green tags, yellow tags, red tags, and black tags. Now we do use this. Or, or very similar systems, we use this for um, triage in general. Green's your walkie-talkies. That's the ones where it's like, if, let's say there's a bus crash, all right? Bus full of kids, gets hit by an 18-wheeler, rolls over down the hill, and everybody in it's hurt. Not everybody's going to have the same level of injuries, and we need to fight, We need to focus on the ones that are the worst off, but that are still stable. So, you know, we get the kids out, and we tell them, all right, if you can walk, if you... We look at them like, all right, you're good, you're good. Raise your hand if you can walk and and you and everything, and then we can see who that is. Send them all over to a tree. Those are your greens. All right, your yellows are they have some some mind some pretty good injuries. These are going to be like your your broken bones, um, somebody who might need a C collar, that kind of thing. That's going to be your yellows. Your reds or your your top priorities. Those are going to be the ones that. Are altered level of consciousness. Um, maybe they are they have issues with their primary assessment, but they're still alive. They're not in cardiac arrest. You know, they could be punctured lungs, um, arterial bleeds, things like that. Things that if you don't fix it now, they will die. But if you fix it, they will live. That that thing, the life or death area stuff. That's your red. And then your black tags are your expectants, and that is they are expected to die, uh, be it that they're already in cardiac arrest, be it if they're unconscious, completely unconscious and not breathing, um, even after you set the airway. So, and, and that's actually, that's probably going to wind up being a test question because I see that a lot. If you see, if you are doing a triage and you come across an unconscious patient, are they a black tag or a, and I'm sorry, they're unconscious and they're not breathing. Are they a black tag or a red tag? The deciding factor is manually open their airway. So you're going to do a jaw thrust. If they 
Take a breath spontaneously. Red tag. If you open the airway and nothing happens, black tag and move on. Um, if you see that on a test, that's the that's the way they're going to do it. All right, and so now this is just the slides are saying what I just said, so we can move on from there. All right, child abuse and neglect. Child abuse means any improper or excessive action that injures or otherwise harms a child or an infant. This can be in any form. So um, emotional abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse. If a kid is being made to eat out of the dog bowl at the, on the floor while the rest of the family sits at the table, that's abuse. If they are physically beaten, that's abuse. Um, you know, if they're just not fed, that's abuse. Over half a million children are victims of child abuse annually, and many of these children suffer life-threatening injuries. Some of them don't make it. If you suspect child abuse, you as an EMT typically are going to be what's called a mandatory reporter. You need to let somebody know. You have to up-channel that. Um, don't pick a fight with the parent. Don't try to, as, as much as you might want to, especially if it looks like they're you know, sitting there gloating and being high and mighty and like, oh, yeah, that effing kid and blah, 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 blah. As much as you might want to punch them, don't do it. Um, just get the kid to the hospital. If the parent wants to ride, even if you suspect abuse, let them ride. Because um, a lot of times they're not going to do anything in the ambulance with another adult there anyway. Most of the time, abuse happens when they're by themselves or it's in tandem with both parents. But, um, when you get to the hospital, notify security or any any ER, like the nurse, the nurse you're giving a report to, let them know that you suspect child abuse. Um, tell them what your evidence is and then let them, they'll do their assessment and go from there. Um, but it is your responsibility to report. If you suspect child abuse and you don't report it, it can fall on you as if you were the abuser. So signs and symptoms as an EMT, child abuse occurs in every socioeconomic status. It's not a poor thing. It's not a rich thing. It's not a Republican or Democratic thing. It's just a thing. All right. People of all walks of life are susceptible to this. So be aware of it. Just because you're riding around in Mansion Central in Atlanta doesn't mean that you may not come across some kind of abuse. You may also be called to testify in abuse cases. It is essential to record all findings, including including any statement made by caregivers or others at the scene. Um, ask yourself the following questions. Is the injury typical for the developmental level of the child? Is the MOI reported consistent with the injury? So in other words, you know, um, they have burns, but the MOI reported was that they fell down the stairs or something like that. It is, doesn't it doesn't match up. Is the parent or caregiver behaving appropriately? A lot of times, if it's abusive, or, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that because that's not always right. a lot of times. If a big red flag for it, because it's not always the case, if the ch if the caregiver will not allow the child to answer for themselves, despite the fact that they should be able to, that's a red flag. All right. So if you're asking, you're asking, remember, because you're supposed to ask the child, if they're like 12 years old, 13 years old, you're asking the child the question, like, what happened? What do you feel? What happened? If mom or dad or caregiver is keeps interjecting and, and giving you the story and not letting the child give you the story, that's a red flag. Was there a delay in seeking care? Is there a good relationship? Um, does a child have multiple injuries at different stages of healing? If they're Boys, especially, we we just we are walking injuries as kids. I, I I don't I can't I can't remember a time where I did not have at least three or four bruises on me. And I was a Nintendo kid, you know. Um, the, the the my friends that I played with out in the yard where they practically lived outside, and I only I mean, you know if I was with them I was outside, but otherwise I was inside playing Nintendo. They looked like they got abused. Um, just because they had bruises all over them. I mean, that was just, it was just part of growing up. But, um, you know, that being said, if it, if, if it's excessive, um, especially in places that don't make sense, if you're bruised around the knees, bruised on your arms in some places, um, but that's it, 
then that's probably just you being rough. If um, if you've got bruises all over you though, on your trunk, on your back, which that doesn't make any sense if you did it accidentally, that kind of thing. Those are the bruises that should really raise some alarms. Um, does a child have any unusual marks or bruises? I think we already said that one. Oh, uh, they may have been caused by cigarettes, grids, branding injuries, that kind of thing. Those are going to be plain as day. You know, how did that happen if not by the parents or a caregiver or somebody? Could have been a sibling, older sibling. Um, so even if that being said, I won't go through all these questions. You can read them yourself. But um, child abuse doesn't always come from above. All right. My uh, One of my cousins got abused pretty bad by his older brother, who was also a child. Um, and, you know, it was always chalked up to just sibling rivalry and, and all that stuff. But, um, yeah, no, looking back, that was straight up abuse. He got his butt kicked all the time and um, bullied by his older brother, all that stuff. And in the 80s, that was, like I said, nobody nobody cared. Nobody did anything about it. Nowadays, it would be reported the kid would, you know, he'd have gotten in trouble. But, um, yeah, abuse doesn't always come from mom or dad. All right. Just just it's it's not that you're not trying to figure out who did it. Um, it could have been a grandparent, could have been an uncle, somebody who's not actually in the house. I mean, who knows? But anyway. Moving on. Let's see where we need to be here. Some more questions. All right. So use the child abuse mnemonic to help you remember the points to look for. So that's what you have here. Consistency of the injury. This is pretty much everything that we just talked about. Um, consistency of the injury with the developmental age, history and inconsistent with the, with the injury, inappropriate parental concerns, be it as they're overly concerned about something that has no bearing or you're like, wow, I would be really freaked out right now, but you just don't seem to give a shit. That's That's part of it. Um, lack of supervision, delay in seeking care. If this is something that a normal person would have called 911 immediately for, but they waited four hours to do it, like say a broken bone, um, that's part. That's a red flag for abuse. Um, affect. That kind of goes in with your your inappropriate parental concerns. Um, affect is more like they just don't care or. They're screaming at the kid, you know, as if it's his fault and not worried about the injury. They're just trying to punish the kid. Bruises of varying ages, unusual injury patterns, suspicious circumstances, and environmental clues. Look around the house. So bruises, um, new bruises are pink and red. Over time, they'll start to turn blue, sometimes green or yellow, and then they'll fade out. So note the locations. Again, bruises to the back. That's not something you can typically do to yourself. Um, I can't think of anything that I could have hit myself with from behind like that with enough force to give me a, a bruise, even if I was trying. Bruises to the back, buttocks, or even your face are suspicious and, you, and usually inflicted by a person. Um, we almost have a reflex not to hit ourselves in the face. So that's that's pretty uncommon. Burns. To areas that no matter how wild you are, you're just not that dumb. Burns to the penis, testicles, vagina, or butt are usually inflicted by someone else. Burns that encircle the hand or a foot like a glove are usually inflicted by someone else. And that's usually by a forced submersion. Like if you had a pot of boiling water and you took somebody's hand and you shoved it into the water against their will, that would cause that kind of a burn. That's Think of that when when that's what I'm saying here. Um, you should suspect abuse if the child has cigarette burns or grid pattern burns like a waffle. Fractures of a humerus and femur don't normally occur without major trauma. Um, a fall from the bed does not count. That's not something that, I mean, even though that's a normal a normal answer, you're not going to break your, humor, your, your humerus or your femur from that. You might break your wrist if you landed on it wrong, but not a long bone. Um, a fall down the stairs could do it. A car wreck could do it. 
But if you're coming careening down the stairs like that, you're probably going to do some damage to the sheetrock and everything too. So if um, if they tell you that he, you know, kid went barreling down the stairs and crashed into the wall and broke his arm, and you look at the wall, there's no damage to it. Or they live in a one-story house. Um, it's probably a lie, and it's it's going to be child abuse. Maintain the index of suspicion if an infant or a young child sustains a femur fracture. That is damn near impossible to happen accidentally outside of like a really wacky car wreck or something of that sort. A complete fracture of the bone in a pediatric patient indicates that the child was exposed to a great deal of traumatic force in a very direct uh, way. So again, look at your mechanism of injury. If it doesn't make sense, then it was probably not the correct mechanism. You were either told something wrong or uh, some kind of information was withheld. All right, shaken baby syndrome. We somebody mentioned this earlier. Um, infants may sustain life-threatening head trauma by being shaken or struck in the head. A lot of times this happens because they're crying and and the parents can't figure out how to make the child stop crying, and then that leads to why won't you stop crying? They're shaking the baby. That's um, that's usually, at least to my knowledge, that's how that's commonly happened. Um, what's happening is, is all the shaking is causing the brain to whop around inside the head and it's going to shear blood vessels. This causes bleeding in the brain, which increases the pressure. Um, if it's bad enough, it could cause herniation. And it's just the same as if they had hit their head on a windshield. So your infant may be found unconscious, often without evidence of any external trauma because they weren't hit. They were just shaken. For neglect. Um, neglect is refusal or failure to provide basic life necessities. So like no food, um, making your child eat dog food because you won't give them real food. You make them eat with the dog. That's, that's neglect. Um, not giving them water, not letting, not giving them clothing or shelter, making them stay outside in the rain or the snow up here, that kind of thing. Children who are neglected are often dirty. They're too thin because they're, they're malnourished. Um, or they appear developmentally delayed because of a lack of stimulation. This is hard. This is one of those tough to get through things because it just makes me want to hug my kids. You may observe such children when you are making calls for unrelated problems. Um, and it could be just like the next door neighbor. It may not have anything to do with the person that you're responding to. Abused children may appear withdrawn, fearful, or even hostile. If they've just had enough of it and they see adults as a threat, they may wind up being hostile to you, even though you've done nothing to them. You should be concerned if a child does not want to discuss or um, discuss how an injury occurred. And occasionally it'll keep getting referred to as a history of accidents. You know, they, they're just really accident prone, which is saying something because my son actually is accident prone. But um it's not like 911 accident over 911 accident over. It's not like that. He just runs into things. Um, be alert for conflicting stories or a lack of concern from the caregiver. And the abuser may be a parent, caregiver, relative, or friend of the family, um, friend of the child. Just depends. But as EMTs in all states are, are um, you must report it. You're mandatory reporters. How you report it, you can look at your protocols. They may tell you who to report to and all that stuff, but you have to say something. Supervisors are generally forbidden to interfere with the reporting of suspected abuse. It has to come from the person who saw it. It's got to be that firsthand. And law enforcement and child protective services will determine whether there's abuse. It's not your job to figure it out, but if you see the signs, um, report it. That's what your job is. Your job's not to be the detective. Or the judge. Alright, so we've got um, two main top. Well, one main topic left, and then this one topic here. So this just goes into more of the abuse. Children of any age and any gender can be victims of sexual abuse. Um, maintain an index of suspicion regardless of the patient's social or economic situation. Again, it's, this is not a rich or a poor thing. Uh, this type of abuse is often the result of long-standing abuse by relatives. If it, it will just continue. 
That's it. And again, it's not always mom and dad. It could be anybody that has access. Your assessment should be limited to determining the type of dressing or, or uh, type of dressing any injuries require. So be EMT mode here, right? Um, treat any bruises or fractures. Don't examine the genitalia of a young child unless there's evidence of bleeding. If there's no BLS reason for you to be there, don't don't go there. Report, report it to the hospital. Uh, let them take care of it. So it's you're pretty much going to treat this like you would treat a rape um, or a sexual assault, like we talked about in previous chapters. You're just not going to do. You're not going to treat them like a piece, like a like a um, piece of evidence on the scene. Just treat the injuries that you may be treating and then report it to the hospital when you get there. Hey, um, I think there might be some signs of sexual assault here or sexual abuse, longstanding abuse, and let the hospital take it from there. Maintain professional composure the entire time. Um, this is a good time to have a poker face if you got one. All right. Assume a concerned, caring approach, which shouldn't have to be faked. Shield the child from onlookers and curious bystanders. Obtain as much information as possible from the child and any witnesses. The child may be hysterical or unwilling to say anything. Um, they may be afraid that they're going to get in trouble. They may be afraid they're going to get taken away, you know, all that stuff. Um, you're in the best position to obtain the most accurate firsthand information, and you are the one that's responsible for writing it down and, and recording it properly. Transport all children who are victims of sexual assault. Don't leave them at the house. Even if it's not something, if the injuries don't warrant transport, but you think they're sexual assault, uh, sexual abuse, they need to go. Cooperate with law enforcement officials in their investigations. All right. So the last thing we're going to talk about tonight, and there's a couple of little topics within this, but we're going to go over SIDS. Um, and then that's going to be it. And we will have tackled the entire pediatrics chapter. This is a long chapter. Still got nine people with me. I'm impressed. All right. Sudden infant death syndrome. The death of the infant or a young child is called sudden infant death or SIDS. Um, and the problem with this is that even after a complete autopsy, the death remains unexplained. 3,500 infants die of SIDS annually. We don't know what this is caused by. It's ultimately, it's a respiratory shutdown, but we don't know, we don't know why. It just, it just happens. Um, the CDC recommends having the baby sleep in the same room, but not in the same bed, chair, or sofa as an adult. A lot of times, um, and I've, you know, this doesn't happen on purpose. I've seen Parents will rock their kid to sleep to put him down for a nap, but because the way babies create heat, you know, I always called my my kids heat factories because they were. You, I'd, I'd sit there on the couch and and have them sleeping on my chest, and next thing I know, it's three hours later, and I fell asleep because they just that that warmth just knocked me out. Um, but a couple of things you don't want to do is, you know, don't go to sleep in the bed with your kid wrapped up in your arm or whatever. Because if you roll over and smother them, um, you just don't you don't want to have that risk. Right. So although it's impossible to predict SIDS, there are some risk factors. Let me get back on topic here. Um, a mother younger than 20 years of age, uh, if a mom smoked during pregnancy and low birth weight. Death as a result of SIDS can occur at any time of day which is kind of the scary thing. And, you know, if it only happened at a certain time, you can just watch out for it. But this could be 6 a.m., 5 p.m., 3 a.m., doesn't matter. You'll face three tasks at an EMT. You have to assess the scene, assess and, and manage the patient, and communicate and support with the family. So here, the biggest issue with this is SIDS is not a um, violent thing. It's not something where the family did something wrong or... You have any weird, real like um, threat or anything like that? You still have to assess the scene, but you're almost you're more worried about an environmental thing, something that maybe the adults were able to escape, like um, carbon monoxide poisoning. You know, just a little bit of it, not enough to make the the adults sick and die, but it was enough to mess up the respiratory system of the baby. Um, 
that's some of the things you're going to look for with that. Assessment management of the patient. If it's SIDS, that means you're dealing with a deceased baby. That is going to pretty much be the end point of your shift. I don't know anybody that's ever had to deal with this and then go back to work right afterward. They usually sent you home. Uh, and then communicate and support of the family because they will be hysterical. An infant who's been a victim of SIDS will be pale or blue, not breathing, and unresponsive. Other causes for such a condition include overwhelming infection, child abuse, airway obstruction from a foreign object or as a result of infection. Meningitis can do this. Um, accidental or intentional poisoning, hypoglycemia, which rarely, rarely happens in babies, but um, sometimes it can. Congenital metabolic defects can also cause SIDS. And when you do your assessment, begin with your ABCs, just like normal. All right, you're going to follow your assessment, your trauma assessment, or your medical assessment as normal. Um, provide any necessary interventions. Depending on how much time has passed, the patient may show signs of postmortem changes. So rigor mortis may have already set in, dependent lividity. Um, all those classic signs that you would see if, if it were an elderly male, or not elderly male, an elderly um, heart patient that passed away, for example, or anybody that died in a chair, um, you would see the same things. If a child shows these signs, call med control. We can't really claim, declare people dead in the field. Uh, but a lot of times um, that's what's going to happen. But you need to get like a paramedic out there or the doctor may do it or, or something of that sort. Deciding whether to start CPR on a child with rigor mortis or dependent lividity can be very difficult. Um, if you do it, it's really, it's mostly going to be for the benefit of the family. Um, so keep that in mind, right? These are, these are tough times. You know, as a provider, if they've already got rigors and postmortem lividity, they're, they're not coming back. All right. But your the family is every bit as much your patient as the baby is. So if you've got the time. Why not? It, it, it at least shows that you cared and you tried. And sometimes that's the family. The family needs that. Um, it doesn't give them false hope, but it lets them if you don't do it, they may see that as you just withheld care like you didn't even try. So sometimes it's better to see you at least try and fail because we we, we can't resurrect the dead. Um, then it is for them, you to walk in and be like. Yep. That one is, that's, that's, he's deceased. I can't do anything. Um, some families may take you to court for that one, even if they can't win, but why, why go through the trouble, win or lose? As you assess the patient, pay special attention to any marks or, or, or bruises, um, just in case there was some kind of abuse. Note any intervention that was done before your arrival. Sometimes they may have tried to do CPR already. Um, make sure that gets into your report especially if they caused any like a bone break or something of that sort, if they did compressions too deep because they were freaking out, um, that may not be abuse, but that's something that you're going to want to mention because it's going to be found in the autopsy. For your scene assessment, carefully inspect the environment, noting the condition of the scene where the infant was found. Um, note whether or not the infant, the infant has been moved from where the the initial discovery from the family was if they you know if the if the baby is still where they found it or if they moved it to another room or something like that uh, note that your assessment should concentrate on the signs of the illness including medications humidifiers or thermometers uh, the general condition of the house do they seem like hoarders um, lots of pets urine smell all that kind of stuff is it just clean or dirty signs of poor hygiene family interaction don't allow yourself to be judgmental about family interactions at this time because they're all, um, they're not even to the coping mechanisms yet. They, a lot of times they're just hysterical to please save my baby. Um, they may not be thinking very clearly at the time, that kind of thing. Uh, do note and report any behavior that is clearly not within the acceptable range, like physical or verbal abuse. If they're screaming, um, not in despair, but more in anger, especially if they're directing it at you or something like that. Note that. Note the site where the infant was discovered. 
as, especially if it's not in the same place where you find the infant. Note all items in the infant's crib or bed, including all pillows, stuffed animals, toys, or small objects, because some of those may have been um, part of the cause, right? I know that back, I know you're in a little bit before my time, but um, shag was huge. Shag carpet. I remember my grandparents had shag carpet way after it went out of style. Um, and I remember taking naps on it. Some of my earliest memories was um, taking naps on that carpet. Somehow I didn't suffocate on it. But, um, you know, all those long strings and stuff like that can get into the nose of the baby and, and suffocate him out. Um, sudden death of the infant is a devastating event for the family. It also tends to evoke strong emotional response among the healthcare providers. Like I said, you get this call at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, there's a very real chance that you're going to go home after you're done with this call because the emotional response that this is going to do is going to just screw you up for the rest of the day. You, you, the next call may just be a stub toe and it throws you over the edge because this right here is going to be so, even if it, or I would say even if, but especially if it's abusive in nature, because then you're going to be stuck with not just the baby dying, but how could somebody cause that? And then it just gets, the spiral goes from there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tough on you. And especially if it's, you know, under normal, most of the time it's not really abuse. So it's going to be tough on the family as well. You have to let them, part of your job is let them express their grief. Um, that's okay. In addition to any medical treatment the child may require, you must be prepared to offer the family a high level of empathy and understanding. Family may want you to initiate resuscitation efforts, which may or may not conflict with your EMS protocols. So just know what those protocols are and understand that, you know, you may, you may decide to do it. If your protocols allow, you may decide to do it just to ease your own mind, ease the family's mind, that kind of thing. Um, but whatever you do, don't speculate on the cause of the death. If it's SIDS, let the autopsy figure it out. Don't don't try to say, well, maybe it was the pillow in the bed or something like that because we don't know for sure. And that's a great way to really screw things up for the survivors because one parent's going to look at the other one and be like, yeah, that pillow that you just bought, and then it goes from there. It may not have been anything to do with it. Um, the family will want to see the child and should be asked – whether they want to hold the child and say goodbye, that's okay. Um, it's like I said, this is this is world rocking. So don't just take the child and leave, and leave them without without any kind of closure or ever seeing or holding the child again. Because that's that's I can't even wrap my head around that one. The following interventions are helpful in caring for the family at this time. Um, learn the child's name early on. Try not to. Try not to keep sticking with your child or or him, her, it, any of that stuff. When you walk in and you're dealing with a situation, ask the child's name from the family and and you know ask them if they're okay with it. But um, it does help to make it more personal if you're using the child's name. They may have a problem with it, so I will ask. I will put that in there. You know, are they okay with you using the child's name? Um, Use the word dead or died when informing the family of the child's death. Euphemisms like passed away or gone really don't, they don't hold much effect. Acknowledge the family's feelings, um, but never say I know how you feel. Because even though, like, for example, you know, I lost both my parents in 2009. And anytime a friend of mine loses a family member or a parent, I even say that. I'm like, look, you know what I've been through. And I'm not going to tell you that I know how you feel, but I know what it's like to lose somebody. So if you want to talk, we can talk and share great memories. You know, I'd love to hear more about your, your good times with so-and-so and stuff like that. Um, that's not just lip service that I really am interested in. I want to be there for my friends. That's just the way that I'm saying it is just things that I've learned over time. Whereas I'm not going to be like, Oh, I know how you feel. Cause no, I don't. Um, even with my losses. No, I don't. I don't know exactly how you feel. And sometimes the whole thoughts and prayers thing can be an insult rather than a, um, you know, like a reassurance. Um, 
Offer to call the family members or clergy if the family wishes. Keep any instructions short, simple, and basic. The more you throw at them, the more they're going to lose it. Emotional distress may limit their ability to process information. Um, a lot of times you'll find they just kind of stare off into space. Like they'll just tune you out for a while because they're too distracted with thoughts going on in their head. Ask each adult member mem uh, individually whether he or she wants to hold the child. Wrap the dead child in a blanket as you would if he or she were alive and stay with the family members while they hold the child. That's that's OK. Um, ask them not to remove tubes or other equipment that was used in an attempted resuscitation. It needs to stay, um, especially for the autopsy and stuff. That way the, the coroner and everybody can see what was done and where it was done, especially if something gets left out of the report. They can, it can wind up in theirs. People express grief in different ways. Some may require your intervention. Um, it's just, it's part of it. Sometimes they'll, they may start hyperventilating, um, pass out, that kind of thing. So the, the extremes of how they're responding, you might have more patients showing up on the scene. Um, if you can kind of head that off, then then do it. Try not to let it, Get to that point. If you see somebody starting to go that route where they're getting a lot of control with their response, maybe walk up and coach them like, hey, I, you know, I know how hard this is. I don't know how you feel, but hey, um, really want to try to get you to kind of take some deep breaths when you, when you like to sit down, you know, that kind of thing. Get them to try to keep them in range because you're looking at it from a medical standpoint. You know what you know what happens if they hyperventilate too much. Um, we don't want that. Further inquiry in the or further inquiry is a responsibility of law enforcement. So again, you're not really trying to um, figure out what was going on. That's not that's not your your job. Some EMS systems arrange for home visits after a child's death so that EMS providers and family members can kind of come to some sort of closure. Um, it can be as difficult for you as it can be for them. A child's death can be very stressful, so take time before going back to the job. If you need a couple of days, that's fine. And nobody can tell you, just as if you were to lose your own family, nobody can tell you how long it takes you to be ready to go back. Um, some people are ready in a day. Some people are ready right immediately, which is kind of scary, but it happens. Uh, some people need more time. And all of that is perfectly fine. Talk with your colleagues. Don't let that stress build up. Um, that's what leads to PTSD and burnout. Be alert for other signs of post-traumatic stress in yourself and others. So nightmares, restlessness, difficulty sleeping, lack of appetite. Consider the need for professional help if these signs occur. Those of you that are in the military, you have access to one source at all times, even if you're no longer in. Um, those of you that aren't, you guys have CISD. All, all ambulance companies have access to that. Usually they have either internal or they um, contract it out. But you also have your personal doctor, um, family, clergy, any, any, whoever you would go to for moral support. They you know, use those things. All right, moving on. Um, apparent life-threatening event. Infants who are not breathing and are cyanotic and unresponsive when found sometimes resume breathing in color with stimulation. A lot of times you may see this right after birth, but Sometimes you can see it with infants that have been home for a little while. These are like near miss SIDS. They kind of, or at least that's what they were called in the past. They um, they were almost like the child was going to be a victim of SIDS, but somehow you got them back. Um, this is characterized by a distinct change in muscle tone, in which technically that means they lose their muscle tone. Oh. Choking or gagging. Now I'll say this, when you're alive, your body, even at full relaxation, when you go to sleep, you still have muscle tone. Your, your muscles never completely relax until you die. Um, and that's the thing. That's why this is scary. It's because when, and it, and it looks like when you see somebody that has no muscle tone, um, it's a, it, it's visible for one thing. It's, it's, a, it's a really scary thing. So in these cases, they lose that muscle tone and then they go limp fish like they are dead. Um, there could be some choking or gagging. And then after the event, the child may appear healthy like nothing ever happened. You must complete a careful assessment and provide rapid transport to the ER because um, we don't know what caused that. 
and in the next time it happens, it may be the full blown thing. Pay strict attention to the airway management because usually that's what the cause is. Assess the infant's history and environment. Um, consider where they were at, right? Could have been an allergic reaction. Could have been something that was sprayed in the room, like a perfume that temporarily caused a uh, bronchospasm. And once it wore off, they were able to recover their respiratory drive. Allow caregivers to ride in the back of the ambulance and physicians will have to determine the cause. We can't, we, there's no way we can do it. And that is it. We have made it through 239 slides. Wow. Um, any questions over the massive amount of information we went over tonight? Yeah. <laughs> My throat hurts from talking all that. All right, give me just a hot second. I'm going to pull up your pin. And we'll call it a night. All right, your pin for the night. BC, Bravo Charlie, 3, 4, P is in pediatrics. BC, 34, P. There you go. All right, if there's no other questions, I'll see you guys next Tuesday after Christmas. Uh, for the last chapter, we're going to go over geriatrics to finish out special populations. Um, get your, your tests done for the last module when, when you get to that point. Um, the important thing to me, because I was looking at your grades, most of y'all are, are close enough for comfort for me. You just need to have everything done before boot camp. All right, no outstanding tests. Um, but you got time. All right, and yes, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. I'll tell you guys that next week. Um, and I'll see you in January. I'm looking forward to it. Y'all have a great night.